Uh, Almighty God, we, the representatives of the, of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to Elders past and present. Please be seated. Councillors, uh, I declare the meeting open and I will commence with a, a couple of notes. Um, I have been reviewing the, uh, the tape of the last few meetings and I will be advising the room that we will no longer tolerate the word lies or liar. Uh, they have been creeping in and they will no longer be acceptable. Uh, some councillors have indicated that the small tables that people sit at in the back of the room are a little bit too small and I've made enquiries on your behalf to address that. Uh, some councillors have made enquiries about the temperature of the chamber. <laughs> I assure you it's very warm and it will warm up as the day goes on. Councillors, are there any apologies? Sir, point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Um, I was ejected out of this place for testing that rule when you applied it um, unfairly to myself and I think it was Councillor Adams uh, from memory. And uh, Councillor uh, Cassidy. So, given you expelled me, but you didn't expel um, Councillor Adams, who used those words, are you saying now that you will expel anyone who says uh, the word lie or call someone a liar? That's not what I said. I said the words won't be tolerated. All right. Are there any apologies? So, sorry. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. No, point Just of to order, be clear, Councillor Johnston. Um, your double standard with respect to no, rulings is no, continuing. No, no. Stop putting words in my mouth. Are there any apologies? Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Maddock will be absent today and I move that he be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Adams, that Councillor Maddock be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,632nd meeting held on Tuesday, 3rd of November 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Adams, the minutes of the 4,632nd meeting of Council held on the 3rd of November 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your, your attention item four, item three. Question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any standing committee? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, as part of our Economic Recovery Task Force, this week Council has launched the Bris Better Local Hub, a website of our local buy initiative for the suburbs. Can you outline where residents can find this information and how they can support our local businesses during these tough pandemic times? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Mackay. Uh, certainly we know that uh, in uh, the community's view uh, and the community's mind, right at the front of that mind, uh, supporting local business is of utmost importance at the moment. And that is also of utmost importance to us as a local government and Australia's largest council. People are now thinking of the impacts of where they spend their money and in how they can spend their money to support local business and local jobs. And that is a great thing. I think if there's some positive things that have come out of this terrible year, it is, uh, I think, right up there at the top of the list that people are now uh, working harder than ever before to support local business and local jobs, and also to be a tourist in their own town. Uh, it is often easy to um, you know, get the emails from various travel websites of all these exotic places around the world that we could go and to dream about overseas holidays. Um, right now uh, we're dreaming about local holidays um, and we're dreaming about what we can do to support business here in Brisbane, in South East Queensland uh, and in Queensland as a whole. And there are so many things to do. One of the challenges that we've had in the past is this simple uh, issue of local Brisbane residents um, not always being aware of what they have in their backyard. And so our Brisbane Local campaign is all about highlighting some of the amazing things that you can do here locally. Uh, and whether it's those business activities and supporting local businesses, or whether it's uh, local facilities that council provides and low cost opportunities, uh, we believe that if we can provide low cost opportunities 
uh, then that leaves more money in residents' pockets to support local business and to have a coffee or to have a meal or to buy something from a local shop, uh, and that is a great thing. So our uh, Brisbane Local campaign, we uh, dipped a toe in the water in recent weeks and started uh, promoting our local precincts online. And I have to say, through that initial uh, program, which involved several ads right across the city supporting local precincts, we had incredible feedback. We had such positive feedback. People loved seeing their local areas and local businesses and local facilities featured. Uh, and I can say the best is yet to come. We have a whole program ahead of us about supporting all parts of Brisbane. Right across the city, uh, there'll be up to 70 different localised precinct campaigns and ad campaigns. Uh, to encourage people to be that tourist in their own town, uh, to support those local businesses and, most importantly, to help people in the time of need when those businesses need customers uh, most of all. Now, it's quite incredible. We know that each year, as people are planning their year ahead, there are many people that this year, um, when they were planning their year, maybe last year or the year before, um, they put aside money for an overseas trip. Uh, who knows someone who did that? Uh, yep, a few people. Uh, and that money now is up for grabs in the local area because people do not know when it will be safe or able to, or they'll be able to travel overseas. And so more and more people are saying, well, let's put this money that I've saved for my overseas trip uh, into a local getaway and local experiences. And so we're here to support our local community and local businesses in doing that. It is quite incredible that there are features of Brisbane that a lot of Brisbane people may not be aware of. Um, and I've got to say, we're all aware of some best kept local secret or a best kept local restaurant or a best kept local coffee shop that other people aren't aware of. Our job now is to get the word out, to, get, to encourage people to support those businesses. And so what we've done is we've created a digital neighbourhood. It is uh, right there on the front page of the council website right now as we speak. Uh, and it is directing and giving people ideas on what to do locally in Brisbane uh, as they plan the coming months and weeks ahead, and particularly as we enter this busy uh, period. It was good to see on the weekend more and more people out uh, in our local shopping centres around the city and in our parks. I sense a real change. I think it was getting that state election out of the way. Um, elections are always confidence killers, but now that that's out of the way, uh, people are looking forward to the end of the year. Uh, they're looking for things to do around Brisbane and around South East Queensland, and we are going to help point them in the right direction, in a direction that supports our economy and our jobs and our local businesses at the time when they need it the most. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you. My question is for the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it has been said that last night's Four Corners expose has redefined what is in the public interest. It has also been said that the LNP has a women problem and that ha there have been politicians who rise on a platform of family values and anti-marriage equality doing the exact opposite and betraying their own traditional families behind the scenes. We also know that in recent times you have personally expressed disapproval and condemned acts of domestic violence. In light of this, can you please tell the people of Brisbane if you are personally aware of any member of Team Shrinner being the respondent in a domestic violence order or having an inappropriate sexual relationship with council staff or members of the media? Um, um, th th uh, there's some elements of that question that are... Look, look, Lord Mayor, I'll call upon you, but there are some elements of that question that, might, that may be... Uh, um, Lord Mayor, please, I'll, I'll ask you to answer the question. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. And that is really quite an extraordinary question. Um, it is, I think a sign that the Labor Party uh, is seeking to plumb new depths uh, in their approach to public policy. What I will say about Team Schrinner and the members of Team Schrinner is that we all, to a person, are passionate about the jobs that we do and representing our communities. But I will say I'm incredibly proud of our team because we are a trailblazing team. 
We are a team that uh, has achieved what governments all around Australia have not achieved, and that is uh, a great equal balance of men and women in the team, uh, and a balance not only in the team itself, but also in the cabinet, in the senior leadership. No other government has had uh, that achievement, and I'm proud that we are the trailblazers. And if there is any party in this place that has a woman problem, and I use the quote that Cara Cook has said, uh, it is the Australian Labor Party, because we have more Fiona's in our team than they have women. <laughs> we, we have a proud record that is the envy of governments around Australia, uh, and we will continue uh, to serve the people of Brisbane faithfully. Point of order. We will continue. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Um, Mr Chairman, I did listen to Councillor Cook's um, uh, question with open ears, and I did see the Four Corners story last sure, night, which was serious. What's the nature serious. of your question? Um, this is not a joke, and I certainly would appreciate the Lord Mayor answering the question as asked. I don't think anyone thinks it's a joke. I think it's a very serious topic, and I think the Lord Mayor is answering the question. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And as I was explaining, uh, Team Schrinner has achieved what no other government has achieved. Uh, and it's funny because there are plenty of people who uh, want to say the right words. There are people who want to make motherhood statements about what they believe in. And then there are other people that just get on and do it and make it happen. Uh, and Team Schrinner is one of those teams. Uh, with our amazing representation and balanced uh, representation of men and women, uh, with a great mixture of people uh, that represent all walks of life uh, in our city and work hard to represent the community that they uh, were elected to represent. I am so proud of my team. Now, I can't speak for other levels of government or I can't speak for what's happening uh, down in Canberra or on George Street, uh, but what I can say is I am proud of my team. My team are all to a person absolutely committed to the job of representing our city and doing a fantastic Point of order, job Mr. Chair. and building a better Brisbane. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Uh, the question was very clear. It is a yes or no response. Are you personally aware of any member of Team Schrinner being the respondent in a domestic violence order or having an inappropriate sexual relationship with yeah. council staff or members of the media? All right, it's well, a very clear question. I understand that. Also, um, Section 37 of the Meetings Local Law identifies that whenever the chairman decides that a motion or any matter, any other matter before the meeting is one of the following, possibly defamatory, likely to prejudice the outcome of a current or proposed investigation process into that matter, required to be kept confidential, subject to legal professional privilege, subject to existing legal impediment, it shall be ruled out of order. Now, I've ruled the question is in order, but would remind the Lord Mayor that in his answer, he must be conscious of those things, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And I am, of course, conscious of those things. And like I said, this is a really extraordinary question and one which I'd really question the motives of and also question where the Labor Party is headed when it comes to standard of debate in this place. Now, we know that uh, they've never seemed to reach the depths of uh, when it comes to uh, it's spreading uh, mistruths, uh, Mr Chair, or uh, spinning issues uh, to make a political point. Um, but really, this is something quite extraordinary. Uh, and all I can say is that I'm proud of my team to a person, uh, and we will continue to do the job that we are elected to do, representing the people of Brisbane and building a better Brisbane. Further questions? Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I uh, move suspension of standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion. That Brisbane City Council reinstates curbside collection instead of offering ratepayers a one-off $29 rates rebate. Second. Just sending that through now, okay. Chair. Um, that's being distributed uh, that's a as, damn good as one. we speak. Uh, council, it's over urgency motion uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy, second by Councillor Cook. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, uh, you have three minutes to urgency um, from now. Your uh, thank, clock will read 3.30. Yeah, thank you. Thanks you very go. much, Chair. Look, this is urgent today because uh, if we don't make a decision uh, as a chamber and as a council uh, to reallocate this money that the Lord Mayor has announced has come back from the Kingston Smith Drive project, the $15 million. If we don't make this decision, the Lord Mayor uh, will continue with his public statements and offer uh, that singular and one-off $29 rebate uh, on rates on January 1. Uh, uh, he never talks about the rates increase, and we've tried to drag that out of him. That'll happen on 
January run to accompany that. Uh, but this is urgent because uh, we think, and uh, we think the people of Brisbane think, uh, that services like curbside collection uh, being implemented in the long term, being paid for for the next two or three years, is more important than a one-off $29 rebate. Uh, the Lord Mayor seems to think that public sentiment is on his side. Uh, I think he will be sorely mistaken, Chair. Uh, when you look at when you look at the engagement uh, online, and we know the Lord Mayor loves a, a, a Facebook poll. That's how he determined he would change a local law around uh, fire pits. So we've run a Facebook poll, Chair, and of the thousands of people, of the thousands of people that have engaged with that, 99.5% of people would rather see curbside collections reinstated than a one-off $29 rates rebate. So it's count, urgent, count, yep. Chair. I was going to say, I think we come back to urgency. You. Yeah, thank, thanks very yeah. much, Chair. It's, it's urgent that we do this now before it's too late. Uh, these decisions will have to be made quite quickly. Uh, and let's have the debate. This is a motion to establish urgency. Well, if they're so, if they're so stuck to their convictions that people really want a one-off $29 rebate, let's have the debate. Uh, let's vote on that and let's get on the record. Uh, and then you can go out and talk to the people of Brisbane and make the case that you think they would rather uh, a $29 one-off rebate instead of curbside collection reinstated for three years. People are sick and tired, Chair, of the Lord Mayor only can listening to them Cassidy, when it suits, yeah, the, when it suits Cassidy, his again, agenda. Your, your, uh, your uh, presentation has moved into substance and I can I ask you to come back to urgency, please? Or have you concluded? All right. I will now uh, put the matter of urgency. All those believe, who believe this matter is urgent, please say aye. aye. And those against, please say no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassie and Councillor Cook. Please ring the bells. All right. Counts. No, please stop yelling across. Councillor Johnston, please stop yelling across the room. Um, Councillors, while we're waiting for the division, I'd like to acknowledge former colleague Councillor Norm Wyndham is with us in the gallery. Welcome back. Good to see you. Councillors, all those in favour of urgency, please say aye and raise your hand. They got, they got there. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Thank you. Uh, clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 18 against. Councillors, uh, the noes have it. We will now return to question time. Uh, Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Standards, Community Health and Safety Committee, Councillor Marks. Councillor Marks, this week's Mark National Recycling Week. Can you please recap Brisbane City Council's local recycling efforts? Councillor Marks. Thank you for the question, Councillor Toomey, and happy Recycling Week to you all. As an organisation, we are always striving to be a national and world leader in sustainability and good recycling practices. I welcome the question because it provides me with an opportunity to reflect on a number of achievements and the ongoing programs Council has in the recycling space. I'd firstly like to say how excited I am that the announcement and award ceremony coming up at the end of November for the winners of this year's Waste Smart Brisbane Awards. Brisbane is home to so many devoted recycling and environmental leaders. The Waste Smart Brisbane Awards are a chance to recognise the incredible efforts of people of all ages in keeping our city clean and green. We received a record 195 nominations and among the 28 finalists being considered by the judging panel, it's great to see a wave of circular economy champions being recognised. The circular economy model is exactly the kind of out-of-box business practice and thinking that will help achieve our city's recycling targets in the long term. With seven award categories and 11 awards and a prize pool of more than $4,000, this year's Waste Smart Awards ceremony will be a fantastic achievement of Brisbane's businesses, community groups, schools, 
and residents doing their bit. For Council's part, during this year's budget, the Chamber will know we, that we announced a raft of initiatives to help residents supercharge their recycling efforts. It include rebates on compost bins and or worm farms, a free upsized yellow top recycling bin on request, and the scrapping of the delivery fee for a new green bin. And I encourage everyone to get online and order them. They come super quick. I have all three of my items now at home. When it comes to composting, I can report that registered participants of Council's community composting hubs have grown by more than by 54% in one year. Mr Chair, we've also been ramping up our efforts to educate residents about recycling at home and one of our greatest successes has been joining the international love food hate waste movement back in 2017. Our adoption of this program and incorporation of its messaging has seen people change their household waste habits and save money. But the proof that residents are doing their part at home and more specifically in the kitchen is in the figures. The average household of four in Brisbane is now saving 64 kilograms more of food waste from going to landfill than they were just a few years ago. That equates to a total drop in food waste going to landfill in our city by nearly a fifth over three years, which is an outstanding effort. Mr Chair, this National Recycling Week, I can pledge that this council will continue to support residents with initiative and programs that help us make Brisbane a cleaner, greener and more sustainable city. We are committed to always investigating opportunities to improve our resource recovery as a city and support product stewardship and initiatives. The success of our recent trial using recycled rubber tyres in our road resurfacing treatments is a good demonstration of that. Mr Chair, happy National Recycling Week to you all. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently you've been spruiking your one-off rates rebate of $29 per property owner. What you've failed to divulge to Brisbane residents is that you're planning to hike their rates not once, but twice next year. This rates rebate is nothing but a consolation prize. People also have the right to know how much their rates bill is going to increase by uh, in each of those rates hikes, and you've refused to release that information in questions on notice today. Lord Mayor, why have you been keeping this plan double rates increase, increase a secret from ratepayers? The Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, Mr Chair, without being in breach of your earlier uh, statement about um, what is appropriate to say and what is appropriate not to say, uh, we are hearing some myths truths being peddled here uh, today, and I'm sure that will surprise you, Mr Chair. Uh, I am not keeping anything from the people of Brisbane. There is a budget that came out. We had a fulsome debate on that budget. We provided all the information, and there were, in fact, uh, extensive budget information sessions uh, uh, where everyone had the opportunity to ask questions, and those questions were all answered. Uh, so there is nothing being kept from the people of Brisbane, but what Councillor Cassidy is trying to do is be a little bit too cute. Uh, he's asking me to speculate on what might be in next year's budget. That's what he's doing. That's no, what he's doing. Councillors, councillors, please allow the answer to be heard. So if Councillor Cassidy doesn't know what's happening on January 1, then he hasn't been paying attention. He hasn't been paying attention because I addressed this matter last week, in fact, in council, and it came up extensively, but he didn't okay, listen. Council, OK, Lord Mayor, councillors, um, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Uh, there has been a level of interjection. Uh, as I often do, I always tolerate some levels of it, but please, it's getting to the point where the answer is have a, having difficulty being heard. Uh, please, the Lord Mayor. You've got... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Three and a half uh, I covered this issue extensively in Council, but Councillor Cassidy doesn't listen. He's got his prepared speech, his prepared question, which someone else wrote for him, but he doesn't actually listen to the answer no, when he okay. asks a question. Councillor Cassidy, you've made the same interjection four times in a row. Um, I think you've made... I think five times and six times in a row you've made... Councillor Cassidy... All right. Councillor Cassidy... Councillor Cassidy... Uh, I consider that you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby request that you cease interjecting uh, and refrain from exhibiting this conduct. The Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor, please continue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, as I explained uh, in the Council Chamber just recently, this will be the first financial year 
for which the average residential ratepayer will have a reduction in their rates bill. A reduction. The first financial year in the history of the City of Brisbane. Councillor Johnston, it's please. It's really quiet. Lord, Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Johnston, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. The Lord Mayor. It's really quite extraordinary because we've seen um, a few things today which uh, would be of interest to many ratepayers. Uh, now, we've seen today that Labor wants to deny them their rates rebate in January. According to Labor, they know better on how to spend that money than the ratepayers of Brisbane do. Uh, they have never seen a tax cut that they like. They have never seen a rate reduction that they like because they, all they can do, it's in their DNA, is spend, spend, spend. And it's not spend their own money, it's spend other people's money. And so rather than giving money back to people, which is what we're doing, they want to take that money and they want to spend it. That's, that's the Labor way. That is the Labor way. And so we will give that money back into people's pockets. We'll put that $29 back into people's pockets because we believe that now is the time uh, when they will appreciate that. Now is the time when they will choose what they want to do with that reduction in their rates. Because we know under Labor, whether it's the state government, the federal government or the council, rates and taxes will always be higher. Rates and taxes will always be higher. Why? Because of the attitude that we're seeing displayed today. Uh, they don't want us to give money back to the ratepayers of Brisbane. They want to spend it. We say no. We say we are proud of the fact that this is the first financial year in the history of Greater Brisbane with the Brisbane local government area where rates will go backwards for the average residential ratepayer. The first year in history. Yet we hear Labor on the one hand complaining that we're not doing enough to support ratepayers, yet on the other hand wanting to spend more and more and more money on different things. It, it, it is a magic pudding. It is a magic pudding that they seem to have at their disposal. Councillors, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. The Lord Mayor. Uh, we understand how to run a budget responsibly. We understand how to keep that budget strong. And even in the most challenging times, uh, we are proud of the fact that we've been able to give something back to the ratepayers of Brisbane, first with a six-month freeze on any rates increases, and then in January, after that six-month freeze, a rebate. A rebate. This is our record. These are the types of things that we want to do to support the people of Brisbane, yet Labor wants to hoover up any savings and they want to spend it. I have made it clear that curbside collection will be back, and it will be back. I've said it repeatedly, and it will be back. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Are there further questions? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, as Brisbane navigates its way through economic recovery, could you please update the Chamber on some of the major construction projects that are currently underway in Brisbane and how they are helping the recovery? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Owen, for the question. It is a timely one. It has been a few months since the Lord Mayor handed down the annual budget, and as we just heard, um, they've totally forgotten what we said in that annual budget. So I'll be happy to talk about the work that we are, have been doing, particularly in making sure that our building and construction industry can come back. They are the lifeblood of making sure that we have money in the pockets of our tradies and our local operators. With Councillor... Uh, Adams, uh, Allen, sorry, I'm doing it myself. So, Councillor Allen at the helm of the Economic Recovery Task Force. Um, there have been leaps and bounds made in the organisation helping out Brisbane businesses to recover. And we did actually have very specific um, measures which we've introduced for the building and construction industry as well. We fast-tracked applications. We've had fee waivers and incentives that have been designed to ensure that the building and construction industry can keep a steady flow of work in the pipeline. And from all the data that's been presented to me as chair at the moment, including feedback from the industry, these initiatives are certainly working. There have been examples upon examples of more applications coming in than in the same period in previous years. Importantly, our policies have been designed to work hand-in-hand -hand with federal government projects like Home Builder. 
And while we've done our bit to keep the industry moving, there are plenty of projects in Brisbane which are very much doing it on their own. For example, 80 Ann Street, which we saw today in committee, Suncorp's new headquarters being built by Mervac, is a massive new office development which will bring some much needed love to the previous slightly unattractive primary industries building site, uh, where there is a $25 million refurbishment. Um, we've also got the 288 Edward Street, a site which now houses Starbucks, very important for when our American visitors come back, as their anchor tenant on the <coughs> ground floor. And Queen's Wharf continues to progress as a structure start to rise as well. The standard on uh, by Aria on Manic Street is starting to take shape, with many levels now complete. Pelicano at South City Square have their next stage ready for construction, including new residential retail and some beautiful green open space as we see more density in that area as well. Predella are coming close to completing their new residential project on Edmondson Street in South Brisbane, which incorporates the much beloved no. Expo 88 Sky Needle as well. No, no. Please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Councillor Adams. The Brisbane Racing Club are progressing with Tullock House at Eagle Farm Racecourse with cranes in the sky there, again being built by Mervac, and Cavcorp have recently put the cranes up on their latest project in Newstead. I've recently joined Mosaic uh, Property Group to turn the sod on their new residential project, the Sinclair, which is a $92 million project creating 2,000 jobs in East Brisbane. Charter Hall of Standards started their brand new office project at 360 Queen Street with excavation happening now. And the often forgotten components of these major parts are the consultants and the experts that are used. When applications are lodged, they hire a town planner, an architect, engineers, they've sought financial advice, graphic designers and marketing is also factored in. This is not just about construction jobs. In addition to these major projects underway, small scale domestic development is very popular last, uh, right now. Hands up if you're in the middle of a COVID renovation. Plenty of people are, if not just building a house and doing the extension. As a part of the Lord Mayor's budget, a dedicated house and homes team was created to fast track these applications that include houses, extensions to existing houses, partial demolition work and other minor change applications associated with all of those above works. And what do we see? when we see houses in the suburbs being built. We have tradies in the suburbs. We have the plumbers, the electricians, the chippies working in the suburbs, visiting the local cafes, the local restaurants, the local takeaways, and the money that they are earning from continuing the building and construction industry is going straight back into the pockets of those small to medium enterprises in our suburbs around Brisbane. 190 house and home applications were lodged with council in one week during October. This team and council has been a major success with all those applications processed within their 20 business day KPI. It is incumbent on this council as an organisation to support the building and construction industry where possible and we will continue to do so. Even when fast tracking is what Councillor Shri called a step in the wrong direction, the suite of our economic recovery initiatives labour, labour labelled as giving developers a free ride, um, we will continue, Team Shrina, to make sure we can do everything Thing to help Brisbane's economy recover from the impacts of this pandemic. Further questions? Councillor Johnston. More free rides for developers. Uh, Lord Mayor, Council's most senior traffic engineers advised both me and Councillor Griffiths that Council was taking a revised proposal to reduce uh, the speed of Ipswich Road Annerley through Annerley Junction back to the Speed Limit Review Committee. La uh, two weeks ago, Councillor McLaughlin said this wasn't true. Why is your administration blocking a speed reduction supported by Council officers and the Department of Transport and Main Roads that would improve safety for Annerley residents and beyond, and I'm glad you've got some talking points today. The Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, look, my uh, ideal outcome here, or the thing that I personally believe would be the best outcome, is for the establishment of a school zone on uh, on that road. And, no, no and injections. Allow you what? No, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Johnston, you've asked a no. question. Please allow the answer to be heard. Uh, and, the Lord and Mayor. we're hearing more mistruths today. I didn't say no. Uh, basically, the state guidelines said no. Um, the experts said no. Uh, but in my view, 
Uh, the issue here is that people are used to, even on major roads, uh, seeing the occasional 40k an hour speed zone. This is something that uh, on major roads like Old Cleveland Road, a range of other, even arterial roads, there are now uh, 40k an hour spe speed zones or school zones in place. So people have become accustomed to this. Uh, what we have been told in this case is that uh, the experts, and in particular the state government guidelines, wouldn't support the creation of a 40k an hour school zone in this location. Uh, now there's various reasons why they put that forward. And what has been put up instead is um, the suggestion that it should be maybe instead of a 60k zone, a 50k zone. Now, look, I understand that this is a proposal and I understand there's various views on that, but uh, there are not too many uh, major arterial roads around the city that have a 50k an hour limit in place. There are not too many. Uh, so this is something that's quite unusual. Now, if you do understand the history of speed limits in um, uh, speed limits in Queensland, you would know that uh, the 50k an hour standard residential street limit was brought in, and the standard rule of thumb is that um, the limit is 50k's an hour unless otherwise signed. That means that you don't see too many 50k an hour signs anywhere in Brisbane, and in fact, uh, I'm aware of plenty of examples of where. Uh, residents that have a 50k street have asked for a 50k sign um, to highlight the speed limit but have been pointed back to the manual of uniform traffic control devices which suggests that generally speaking um, you shouldn't install 50k an hour signs because the rule is if there's no sign it's 50. Um, so it causes Point confusion. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, I'm actually Johnson. addressing the issue, Mr Chair. Yeah. Not that I'm hearing. No, no, well, uh, my make, question, make yes, your point of order. It's relevance, Mr Chairman. My question was, why is his administration blocking the speed reduction supported by council officers and the Department of Transports and Main Roads? That was the question. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, that's what I thought the question was. And the Lord Mayor has been answering it. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. And so, uh, you're right, Mr Chair. That's exactly what I have been answering. So what we would see here is potentially a first of its kind situation in Brisbane that, that I'm aware of, where on a major road, there would be a 50k an hour limit. Um, so this is not what people are used to seeing on major road networks. They can, they can understand there's 40k an hour school zone signs and they see them in various locations. They're used to them. There's flashing lights to highlight the change in speed. But on a major road to suddenly have a 50k zone, I think could potentially lead to some confusion uh, and... No, no, no. Councillor Johnston, please allow the answer. I trust that you're very interested in it. Please allow it to occur, the Lord Mayor. And so, uh, you know, th there's, right, there's rightful discussion about what is the appropriate option here. And as I said, my preferred option, this is my personal view, is that the appropriate option would be a 40k an hour zone. Councillor Johnston. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, Councillor Johnston. Lord Mayor, please. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you're displaying unsuitable media competence. Please allow Councillor Johnston to answer the question. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Please. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby request that you cease interjecting and refrain from interjecting into the future. The Lord Mayor. Thank you. I think you will find, Councillor Johnston, through you, Mr Chair, that if you read the petition response, it would have highlighted the State Government guidelines, which didn't allow a 40k an hour school zone limit to be placed on this road. Uh, so we see this little game that Councillor Johnston plays continually, where uh, everything in the whole universe is council's fault. It's never anyone else's fault. Ne never mind that it's a state government manual of uniform traffic control Councilor devices. Councillor Johnston, never I've asked mind you to stop that interjecting. It's, that it's a state government speed review. Uh, never mind that the state government policy says you can't do it. Apparently it is our fault. Uh, but we see that uh, with a number of councillors on that side of the chamber. Everything that happens is our fault, um, yet they're quick to claim credit for everything that we do as well. So uh, what we see here is Councillor Johnson misrepresenting the situation. Uh, I would, as I said, uh, be certainly open to the state government amending their advice so that we can put a school zone in this location. That would be, I think, a sensible outcome. That would fit in with what people are used to seeing. The Lord Mayor, uh, your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Harden. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee. Councillor McLaughlin, this administration is committed to delivering new and upgrading infrastructure to build a better Brisbane. 
Can you please provide the Chamber with an update on current and upcoming infrastructure works that will make travel across the city safer for all? Councillor McLaughlin. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, through you to Councillor Hutton for the question. Um, this is an especially important time to deliver new and improved infrastructure for Brisbane. We need to create jobs and support local suppliers. That's exactly what we're doing in all corners of the city. There is work underway to build a better and safer Brisbane. I'm pleased to give an update on this suite of works, particularly focusing on safety upgrades and pedestrian improvements. Um, safety is the first, second and third priority in all works on the network across our city. Uh, and some examples of this, Mr Chair. Uh, the Main Street and River Terrace intersection upgrade has been underway in Kangaroo Point since the middle of this year. This intersection had, uh, has a high crash history and carries a large volume of traffic, 66,000 vehicles per day. The number one priority of this project has been reducing the high number of side swipes and rear end accidents that have been occurring. Main Street now has two dedicated right turn lanes into River Terrace. In the next few weeks, the speed limit along River Terrace will also be reduced to 50 kilometres per hour to provide a safer environment for all, particularly pedestrians. The contractor has been working hard to accelerate this project and it's now ahead of schedule with the project due for completion in the coming weeks. Uh, Mr Chair, another in intersection upgrade underway, which is also in Councillor Three's ward, is the Montague Road and Victoria Street project in West End. Work commenced last month to install traffic lights with signalised pedestrian crossings, a new right turn lane on Montague Road, new on-road cycle facilities and new footpaths. We recognise that West End is a vibrant part of the city with a growing business precinct, so I trust this project will continue to build on the previous actions Brisbane, our council has taken to help Montague Road safer. We expect to see the lights switched on in early 2021. Uh, moving a little further south of the city to Annerley, there are new traffic lights being installed at the intersection of Ipswich Road and Ponsonby Street, funded by the Australian Government's Black Spot program. Prior to this upgrade, the intersection has been a non-signalised crossroad controlled by give-way signs and stop signage. The high volume of traffic on Ipswich Road is making it difficult for vehicles to find a gap when turning into or out of Junction Terrace and Ponsonby Street. This work kicked off in October and will be completed early next year. And there's another two black spot programs, uh, projects on the go. The London Street and Stanborough Road intersection upgrade in Belmont kicked off last month and uh, which will install a roundabout to improve safety. Uh, the black spot project at the intersection of Sir Fred Chanel Drive in St Lucia will commence construction this month. This upgrade will improve the turning lanes at this intersection, which is very close to the University of Queensland. Um, Mr Chair, moving to some of the pedestrian improvements that have recently been completed across the city. I'm pleased with this one in particular in the CBD. The notorious slip lane at the Ann Street and Creek Street intersection has been removed to reduce the risk of pedestrians and vehicle collisions, which is very close to uh, Central Station. The traffic signals have also been upgraded with pedestrian protection, meaning pedestrians are given more time to safely cross the road before a vehicle can turn across their path. These improvements, Mr Chair, were identified as necessary outcomes of the Move Safe review and have now been delivered. Finally, two pedestrian bridges have recently undergone refurbishment to improve active travel connections. Work to replace the Shellgate Street pedestrian bridge in Chermside West will be completed in a matter of days. Uh, this involved replacing the existing timber structure with a new steel and concrete bridge with upgraded footpaths at either end. In Fernie Grove, the Beach Street pedestrian bridge over Cedar Creek is being replaced with a new three metre wide deck to better accommodate walkers and cyclists. This is due for completion in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Mr Chair, there's always plenty happening in the Infrastructure for Brisbane program and there's much more coming too. Uh, throughout November and December we'll be gearing up for the start of construction on several Better Roads for Bis Brisbane projects. Among some of the first upgrades to kick off early next year are the Hoyland Street upgrade and Norris Road projects. Um, Mr Chair, in line with Council's procurement policy, 
This upcoming suite of projects will seek to support local contractors. Program 2 has a strong track record of engaging local contractors to improve our road and travel infrastructure. Last financial year, 94 per cent of Brisbane infrastructure programs procurement was spent for projects were with South East Queensland companies. Several of these significant upgrades are due to go out to tender before the end of the year, and I would encourage all Brisbane-based contractors Councillor to McLaughlin, throw their hat in expired. the ring. Councillor your time has expired. Any further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks for much, Mr Chair. Uh, yep. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in Brisbane City Council's own figures, it shows that job losses in Brisbane won't recover until March 2022. Despite knowing the dire economic situation Brisbane residents are in and will continue to be in uh, for 2021 and 2022, you have ordered a double rates hike next year. Lord Mayor, why are you planning to hike rates bills twice in January 2021 and July 2021 in the middle of a deep recession? Lord Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Chair, for the question. Uh, what did I just say about this? He, that you answer a question, he doesn't listen to the answer, and then he goes back to his pre-prepared question in which someone else wrote for him. Like, it is unbelievable that we have a Leader of the Opposition that is so inept at you know, moving on his feet that he can't adapt his strategy in question time. He's got one job, <laughs> one job. Now, first of all, there will not be what Councillor Cassidy said. He's assuming an outcome in the next financial year budget. He's assuming what might happen. Those decisions haven't even been made yet. But what he is doing is he's standing in the way of a rate reduction through the way of a rebate with the payment of Kings of Smith Drive savings to ratepayers. He's against us giving money back to ratepayers, yet he's complaining about rates. It is unbelievable. Labor can come in here week after week and fail to have a consistent, coherent policy and approach on anything. They simply say whatever comes into their mind or whatever they think might get them a story. And it's just really quite extraordinary. The people of Brisbane deserve better than this, you know, constantly changing approach from Labor. Pick an approach and stick to it. But don't stand up here and argue one thing in one question and the exact opposite in another question. We want to give people a rate rebate of up to $30 or almost $30. Labor just voted against that or they voted uh, or they suggested that it should not be paid. Yet now they are saying that ratepayers are doing it tough and need more relief. It, it, it is really quite extraordinary. Uh, our position is consistent. Uh, we offered the first uh, rate freeze in around 35 years, and then on top of that, by paying this $30 rebate, we will see for the first time in Brisbane City Council history the average rate bill for rate, residential ratepayers in Brisbane go backwards. Backwards. Never happened before. It didn't happen during the 2011 flood. It didn't happen during the 1974 flood. It didn't happen during the various economic crises that we've faced as a city, but it happened this year. And it happened because of the responsible financial management of the LNP. And so Labor can say on the one hand that we need to give relief, but on the other hand say we need to spend more money on all these different types of things, but that is not real life. That is not how budgets work. Now, I know Councillor Cassidy is a bit shoddy with numbers, uh, and that probably comes from his union background, but the reality is it requires a responsible approach, someone that can count and someone that knows that if you're spending less or receiving, if you're receiving less in income, that you can spend less in income. And you can't also get one bucket of savings and then promise to do multiple different things with the same money. Uh, you have to choose an approach and stick with it. And Labor consistently chops and changes in the hope that they can uh, get a story up, in the hope that they can convince uh, a couple of, uh, I guess, uh, rate, uh, unsuspecting ratepayers that what they're saying has some credibility. But the reality is uh, any kind of scrutiny on their approach shows that it is just not credible. It's just not credible. This administration acted quickly and decisively in response to the economic situation that we're in. We stepped up straight away and we introduced a range of different initiatives even before the budget came out. 
Uh, we uh, waived a whole heap of fees and charges and rents. Uh, we uh, acted quickly on parking enforcement and parking metres. Uh, that support in terms of rents and licence fees and permit fees is ongoing and it, and it will continue until the end of December. Uh, and then, on top of that, we found some savings in a project, a well-managed, exceptionally good infrastructure project. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin, thank you. A, a project which we're getting incredible feedback about. People love Kingston Smith Drive. They love it. And they love it even more because they're getting a reduction in their rates next quarter as a result. Uh, that is the double plus. And uh, we right, are proud right, of that achievement. Topic, please, and we will man. continue striving every day to deliver more for the people of Brisbane, uh, to keep the budget strong and balanced, and to provide uh, high quality projects and services to the people of Brisbane, Mr Chair. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Je oh, I was going to say Speaker. Sorry, no, yeah. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Your point of order? Um, yeah. I move that I I move um, suspension of uh, so much of standing orders uh, to enable me to move the following urgency motion. I move that this council immediately takes a proposal to reduce the speed limit on Ipswich Road Annerley through Annerley Junction to 40 kilometres to the Joint Speed Limit Review Committee, as it did for Oxley Road, Corinda, and other accident-prone roads. Seconded. All right, I have an urgency motion moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor uh, Griffiths. I believe it's been distributed. I've emailed it through. All right, it's been emailed. It'll arrive. I've seen it will be distributed uh, momentarily. Councillor Johnston, your time was three minutes. Your clock will be reset in a moment. There it is. Three minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, I rise to speak on this urgency motion today, and I would ask that it be voted um, on, and I'm hoping the Lord Mayor's going to uh, allow it to progress. Um, it is urgent that we consider this speed reduction on Ipswich Road annually, because for the past decade, I have been raising it in this place on behalf of local residents who care about the safety of children who go to school, who care about the safety of elderly residents who cross the road, and who care about the amenity of um, Annerley Junction and the Annerley Junction shopping area. Um, my community has made it very clear to me that they support a speed reduction along Ipswich Road annually. I have, with the community, um, through town hall meetings, through previous petitions in this place, um, lobbied for a school zone or 40 kilometres an hour. And that has been rejected by this LNP council. C Councillor Johnson, I appreciate, Today, I appreciate the point you're making, yep. but that's the, yep. your arguments are substance. Please return yep. to urgency. And today, it's urgent that this council makes a clear and unequivocal statement <laughs> that they support 40 kilometres an hour, because clearly, a a few years ago, they rejected 40. Last two weeks ago, Councillor McLaughlin rejected 50. Now, based on the Lord Mayor's comments today, he actually supports 40. Now, I know that the state government support a reduction of the speed limit. I know that the officers were prepared to take a speed limit proposal for 50 back to the committee. Somebody has put the kibosh on it. Let's be clear. I don't want anybody else to die. Two people have died, died on Ipswich Road Annerley in the Annerley Junction crossing. Another resident died almost two years ago around the corner in Venner Road. This road has hundreds of accidents every single year. It is a dangerous road and the Annerley Junction functions as a local neighbourhood shopping area and it is unsafe. We must, as a council, send a clear message beyond the public record about what we support. And in my view, um, I fully support 50. Uh, sorry, I fully support 40. That's what we wanted from the beginning. And if the compromise was 50, um, as Councillor and Griffiths and I were told, we were happy to support that. Something is better than nothing. But if the Lord Mayor is genuine today, he will allow a debate on this matter. He will um, vote for 40 kilometres an hour. He will then direct officers to prepare a submission to take to the road Joint Road Safety Committee, and he will advocate for a speed limit reduction to 40 kilometres an hour on Ipswich Road annually. He says he supports it. Well, now is the time to show us. On uh, Oxley Road, Corinda... Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. On the matter of urgency, uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. 
the um, the uh, the, re the required um, new numbers are satisfied for um, debate. That motion has been distributed to all councillors. I believe. I believe that's correct. Um, Councillor Johnston will reset your uh, clock there, and the uh, ordinary debate will begin on the substance, please. Councillor Johnston. Right. Firstly, thank you uh, for agreeing to allow the urgency motion uh, to proceed. Um, I do not want to see any more political games about this. People I know have died, and it is not acceptable that this council and the state government plays political games. Um, for over a decade, I've seen other councillors in Annerley come and go, and then there has been one fundamental thing that people have said to me, and that is they want to make Ipswich Road Annerley safer. Uh, Councillor Johnston, I must apologise. This is my error. Um, could you please move your motion and we'll get a seconder? Oh, I'm sorry. No, yep. that's my, it's, I should have asked you earlier. Could you please move your motion and get a seconder um, um, to make it formal? Yep, I'm just going to have to pull it up from the sent items because I... No, that, that's all right. It's, um, I only have it. As I say, the, the, once yep. urgency was satisfied, yep. we now move to substance. Okay, Could you I please move that? Yep. No, Here we go. I move that this council immediately takes a proposal to reduce the speed limit on Ipswich Road, Annerley, through Annerley Junction to 40 kilometres to the Joint Speed Limit Review Committee, as it did for Oxley Road, Corinda, and other accident-prone roads. Seconded. The motion as read has been moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Uh, the debate will commence. Councillor Johnston, your uh, clock will be amended to reflect the lost time. You'll have nine and a half minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, and uh, I appreciate that I've been able to put the motion on the agenda today. I might say it's, it's the first time since I've been an independent that I believe I've actually been allowed to have an urgency motion. It's taken ten and a half years. And I can think of no better, no better reason than to reduce the speed limit on one of Brisbane's most dangerous roads. Um, it, it is unacceptable to me that there is this game playing going on between the state government and council, and it's been going on for many, many years. Um, uh, a few years ago, um, council reduced um, the speed limit on Oxley Road through Corinda to 40 kilometres an hour where not a single person had asked for it, but where residents have been calling out for it in Ipswich Road, Annerley, through petitions, through Move Safe. Um, through um, uh, more petitions. We're still waiting on the last petition that Councillor Griffiths and I did to come to this place for debate. They've been calling out for safety improvement to one of Brisbane's most dangerous roads, and that's Ipswich Road, Annerley. Um, when 40 came to this place, and I would say it's about three years ago, um, the petitioners were very clear um, that they wanted a speed reduction to 40 along Ipswich Road. It does not matter to me whether it's a um, school zone or if it's 40. Um, we just want the speed reduced. Every single day, residents tell me about cars that run through the lights that are speeding through there and the near misses that they report. It's only a week and a half ago I walked to school with Junction Park State School residents for the active uh, school travel event, and I understand that we have tiny children crossing one of Brisbane's busiest arterial roads. It is an accident hotspot. Two people have died in this location, and as I said, another one, um, Dr Jeff Copeland, passed away just around the corner in Venner Road. Um, during peak hour, we know from Council's traffic surveys that the traffic is generally under 40 kilometres an hour through that area. Um, it is really, really important um, that we send a clear message today that 40 should be the speed limit. And as I said, I don't mind if it's 40 permanently or if it's a school zone, but we need to get the speed reduced. Um, I, do, I, I fear that this is more game playing from the LNP. Um, we know that um, Council did not support the speed reduction uh, when it went up uh, earlier this year. And I was told by one of Council's most senior traffic engineers that they would have another look at it and that it would go back a second time with a recommendation for 50 to Ipswich Road, Annerley in Annerley Junction. Now, that's what we were both told on the record by senior council engineers. When I asked about it a couple of weeks ago, Council McLaughlin just denied, denied it. I made file requests to the CEO, a request to say, where are the files about what's happened? They just denied it. No more game playing.
Lives are at risk, and I don't want to see anybody else hurt. I don't want to see anybody else die, and I want to see not just 40. I want to see um, all the other range of safety measures that are out there for Ipswich Road annually, and there are a lot of them that this council is fully aware of. I want to see them investigated and delivered. That means better footpaths. That means better bikeways. That means a feasibility study for a tunnel. That means better lighting. That means means a green, uh, green safe crossing point on Eckerbin Road annually. At the moment there is a slip, a slip um, road and you can't cross the road safely. Um, it is just unreasonable that this council will not address these safety issues despite the overwhelming and clear um, support of local residents. So if the Lord Mayor supports 40, today is the time to send a clear message because those poor council officers' heads must be spinning down there when they're told, no, you can't have this, and then you go and do this, and now it's, no, we want this, back to where we were, I think it's three years ago. I think it's three years ago that we discussed the 40, the last 40, and you all voted against it. You all voted. We had this same discussion, same discussion, and not everybody, because there's some new councillors who'd be like, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but a lot of people here, um, they all voted against it. So let me be clear. I don't want game playing. I want action. The people of Annerley that I represent want action. The people of Annerley that Councillor Griffiths represents, and to his credit, he immediately stepped up and said, I will help you. And he's worked hard over the past year um, on the 40 kilometres an hour um, with his side of Annerley Road. I don't want to see a community divided by a road. I want to see it safe. I want to see 40 in place. How we deliver that, I'm, ha I'm certainly open to suggestions. School zone or seven to seven or 24 hours, I don't mind, but we need to reduce the speed. Um, it is, the officers are very clear on why. There are too many sets of traffic lights. This is what they tell me. This is why Ponsonby Street is such an odd proposal. There are too many sets of traffic lights through Annerley, which is what they say contributes to the accidents and the bad driver behaviour. Um, well, let's slow it down. Let's slow it down so if someone is hit in Annerley Junction, they're not going to be killed. That's the minimum that we should be doing. And I'm talking, this is, if we were looking at something over its lifespan, this would be learning how to crawl, reducing it to 40. There is so much more to do. And I just want to say, um, I hope you all vote for it, and then I can tell you I will pursue it to the end of the earth with, internally with council and with the state government until we get 40 kilometres per hour. And again, I just want to say a big thank you to Councillor Steve Griffiths, who's been on this journey with me. I know it's an issue that Councillor Shree is really concerned about as well. Um, obviously, I'm focused on my part of Ipswich Road annually. That's the nature of the work that we do. If um, Ipswich Road... Annerley, uh, sorry, Ipswich Road Maruka or Ipswich Road um, through the Gabba was to be an issue as well. I would certainly support it in those areas. But I, I just want to say it's so important that we take action. Council has done report after report that they're hiding. They've done um, petition after petition here. Our community has had town hall meetings, public meetings. We've had the ABC come out. We've done so many things to get action on Annerley Road. It's time to stop talking about it and it's time to do it. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, uh, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Johnston take a Councillor quick question? Johnston, will we take a question? Thanks. Through you, Chair, to Councillor Johnston. I'm just interested in, do you have a view on a particular street or two streets between which you think the speed limit should be reduced? Councillor Johnston. Uh, look, I'm open to suggestion on where it should be. Um, Venner Road or Eckerbin Road probably are a good starting point. Um, how far it goes towards your end, I don't really know, but certainly possibly to the McDonald's or uh, past Ponsonby Street. But again, I am open to suggestion. I just want to see, particularly through that shopping precinct in Annerley Junction, um, and the limits of where we put it, I am open to um, further advice and discussion. I know the council officers have done a lot of work on this, and I do think it was somewhere between Eckerbin Road and Ponsonby Street that they were looking at. Um, but I, I know that they've been working on it because I've been asking them. I've been asking them to do this. Um, we as a community have been asking them to do it. And as I said, the time for talk is over, and now is the time for action. Oh, and I will just put on the record that um, in just a few weeks' time, and I'm so pleased I got the chance to do this, in just a few weeks' time, um, the person who killed 
Dr Jeff Copeland on Venner Road Annerley is going to be sentenced. And his family has contacted me. I'm in regular contact with them. Um, and they want me to speak up to get safety improvements in Annerley. They want me to advocate for speed reductions for traffic safety improvements on Venner Road and Ipswich Road. It is so critical that we do not ignore deaths that do not need to happen. Um, Jeff was an innocent pedestrian on the street. Um, and the problem with Ipswich Road, Annalee, in my view, contributed to what happened, as well as um, certainly uh, the issues surrounding the driver behaviour. Um, but it's so important that for the Copeland family, um, the Pacific family and the Knight family, um, that Jeff's death is not in vain and that we take real action as a council to make sure um, that the speed limit is reduced on Ipswich Road, Annalee, and, and that we move on then to the next thing, which are the infrastructure improvements that are urgently needed as well. And as I said, that's more safe crossing points, better footpaths, better lighting, um, better bike facilities, and a feasibility study Councillor to investigate Johnston. a tunnel. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Are there any further speakers? Count, uh, the Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, look, we will be supporting this proposal uh, because it is a proposal that we have supported in various ways in the past. A absolutely. And no, no interjections, please. Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnston stands up here and in such a pious manner suggests that she is the only one that cares. To suggest that no one in this council chamber cares except for her um, is just absolutely uh, out of touch with reality. We all care about road safety. We all care about reducing the accidents on the road network, and we all care when someone is injured or killed on our road network. We all care. And so I've made it clear that I would support a 40k zone in this location. And why, why is that? Because personally, as a local councillor, I'm aware of other situations in this city where I have personally campaigned for a 40k zone to be introduced for similar reasons. And in fact, Councillor Shree knows that uh, I, I was leading the way when it came to a speed limit reduction next to Carondale Shopping Centre. The speed limit there, after lobbying very hard for myself and pushing through a whole heap of re red tape and guidelines, uh, we managed to get a trial for a 40k zone on Carondale Street. Now, Carondale Street, if you're not aware, is the street behind the shopping centre where the bus station is located. And across the road, there's an aged care facility and also some new uh, unit and townhouse developments. There's a high level of pedestrian activity. There's lots of vehicle movements. There's buses and heavy vehicles coming in. Uh, and it was a situation where I genuinely believed that a 40k limit would improve safety. I had to fight for it. And in the end, I got it as a trial. And guess what? Now it's permanent. And we have subsequently, as an administration, gone on to introduce 40k limits at a whole range of locations across the city places like Stone's Corner. I could go on. We did that because we care. Now, Councillor Johnston is suggesting that we're somehow blocking a 40k limit. That has never been the truth. The reality is that the state guidelines have been such that it makes it extremely bureaucratic. It makes it hard to get a clear decision. And with this committee of different agencies coming together to reach an agreement on a way forward is very difficult. So why I support this motion today is that this council chamber can give some clear guidance to that committee that this is what we would like to see. Now, in the end, we don't have control over that outcome. Councillor Johnston would like everyone to believe that it's us that has the ultimate control, but we don't. So I would like to see a 40k limit on that street. That is my desire, and I know it's supported by my team because we've introduced it in other places and it has been effective. And guess what? I know the Minister, uh, Mark Bailey, would also be supportive. In fact, we received a letter from uh, Minister Bailey just recently in September. And I want to quote from that letter. It was about road safety. Um, it said, TMR supports safe, appropriate and credible speed limits based on the road environment and use. We know that speed limits of 40 and lower make our streets safer, more accessible and attractive places for all road users. Additionally, these safer limits have been linked to more walking and cycling, fewer crashes, near misses, as well as noise and economic and emission benefits. 
And so I think we're all on the same page here. Councillor Johnston wants 40. I'm happy to see 40 introduced. Minister Bailey says 40 is a good thing in various locations, and I think he would be supportive of 40 here, I'm sure. Let's see if we can get that outcome. Let's wade through the state government process that has been set up with us and get the outcome. We support it. And we can point to the correspondence, letter after letter, back and forward, with us trying to get an outcome. We put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into trying to get this outcome. It's evaded us to this point. But guess what? I'm saying today, we support a 40k limit. Now, how that is applied, the, the absolute, um, the length of the, the speed limit, all of those issues can be resolved. But in principle, we are saying, as a chamber, we support a 40k limit. And that gives uh, further weight to our submission that will be made through to this speed review committee that we want to see a change here. We've seen it work in other places. I think it can work well here. I think there's a sensible solution that will improve safety. And Councillor Johnson, no one is playing games here. This is a process that is quite clearly wanting and it would be great to get it fixed so that we can actually get positive outcomes for the people of Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak in support of the motion as well and to congratulate all parties for their support of lowering the speed limit. Um, won't surprise anyone to know that I'm certainly a strong advocate of this and I think it's something that um, a lot of people in my electorate as well would welcome. The, actually, the, the area in question also falls within... Uh, half of the area in question falls within the South Brisbane State electorate and I, I know the new State MP for the South Brisbane is also very supportive of a 40k zone in this precinct and was talking about it during the state election. So you'll have no objections from the Greens either at the council or the state level. I was going to suggest that um, an appropriate uh, stretch of the corridor would be from Ponsonby Street right through to Venner Road. And I'll leave that suggestion for the Lord Mayor and, and Council McLaughlin to think about as well. Um, my view is that the corridor should be dropped to 40 on a permanent basis. It shouldn't just be a school zone. Obviously, I would support a school zone as well, but I think um, there are enough, there's enough justification to make it a permanent 40 kilometre an hour zone. It's a high activity area. Uh, as others have noted, there's a lot of small businesses along that frontage. Uh, there are no separated bike lanes, which means that cyclists on, on occasion are actually riding on those very fast roads as well. So, from a pedestrian cycling safety perspective, there's definitely merit in a permanent 40k reduction, but also in terms of the precinct positive impacts for activating that streetscape and, and supporting those local businesses. I think there's a lot to be said for dropping the speed limit round the clock, and I hope I'm, and I'm, I trust that Councillor McLaughlin will, will take that suggestion seriously and, and look at a permanent 40k reduction from Ponsonby right through to, to Venner Road. Um, I just also would note that there's already warning signage in the vicinity of Ponsonby that advises motorists to take the curbs at 40. Um, so it seems like, at least from an advisory perspective, we're already telling motorists that this is an appropriate stretch to be driving at 40 on. Um, it would seem common sense that we can permanently drop that speed and formalise that change. Um, I share concerns that other councillors have raised about how bureaucratic and uh, inefficient and often self-contradictory this speed limit review process actually is. Uh, but I'm also sometimes a little frustrated that at both levels of government, officers seem to treat the MUTCD as rules rather than guidelines. Um, they are not binding rules, they are guidelines and I've read them in, in some detail and they do allow administrations quite a bit of scope to initiate trials and to uh, go beyond or work around the guidelines where there's a strong case for doing so. Um, and I understand that sometimes the problem is finding an RPEQ who's willing to sign off on the, um, on the changes or a non-standard approach. Um, but I do think there's, there's room for this administration to be a little bolder. And I've had a couple of occasions in the past where neither level of government wants to initiate a change, but both levels of government are privately supportive of a change. And it seems like that might have happened here as well for some time. Um, and I think it's, it's actually a good time for council to be a little bolder and to start saying, well, if the local council is supportive of a, a non-standard speed limit or a speed limit trial that's slightly outside the MUTCD, that we then proactively take that to the state government and put that forward. Um, and I've got plenty of locations in my ward where I'd like to see that happen too. I won't bore the chamber now with a long list, but 
Um, I, I do think there's a need for this administration to be a little braver and a little more proactive about initiating these changes. I acknowledge that in this case, the, the mayor feels like they've already done a lot or done enough, but I, I do always think there's a bit more we can be doing. Um, so thanks to all parties for their support for this change, and hopefully it can happen quite soon. Um, if, if it doesn't, I'm happy to go out there and change the signs myself, and that offer remains open to anyone who wants, me to, take, wants to take me up on it. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Griffiths. Is my that's on? Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Firstly, I'd just like to congratulate Councillor Johnson uh, actually on her passion with this issue. I know it's gone on for a number of years, Councillor Johnson. Certainly, uh, long before I became councillor for uh, for that section of Annerley. Um, I know it's been very stressful for you, and I know that you've represented your community well, uh, and I think that you uh, continue to do so. I think. For me, in this chamber, you're one of the most uh, passionate souls here, and you always convey that well. Um, and 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 uh, and I have to say, it's reflected in your vote. Um, I, in terms of this issue, it has gone on for a long time. I support a 40k or a 50k zone through that particular area, uh, through that particular stretch of Ipswich Road. I've voiced that to the chairperson and the previous chairperson, Councillor Cooper. Uh, it just makes sense. Um, obviously, we've got to get a balance, and everyone's talking about the local community there, but we do fit into a bigger city, and we do need to remember that it's a major thoroughfare for the south side. We need to keep trucks and freight and uh, people moving. They do come from the outer suburbs. They come from other parts of the city, through our city, so we need to keep that area moving. So, obviously, we've got to find a a common sense approach to that. I agree with the Lord Mayor. Uh, my understanding from, from my discussions with uh, um, Mark Bailey MP is that he does support this, um, this reduction in speed as well. So it's good to know that the Lord Mayor and the Transport Minister both um, have common ground on this. So I'm hoping that we will see some action on this as well. Um, where that is done, you know, once again, I'll leave up to the expertise of the transport officers. Um, I do know that the Lord Mayor was saying there's very few major arterial roads that do have 40k zone on them. This road, about two kilometres down, um, outside the, the Catholic community there, Merrimack, has a 40k zone there. So there are precedents for Point a 40k order. zone. Point of order to Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Uh, well, uh, yep, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, so there is a 40k zone already existing on Ipswich Road. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Uh, I was referring to 50k zones on major roads, not 40k zones. Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak to this uh, debate and discussion uh, and thank the Lord Mayor for his commitment that he's given here this afternoon. As, and he quoted from the letter that was received from the Minister for Transport, Mark Bailey, right on the eve of them going into the caretaker process for the state government. Uh, but um, I, I agree with the sentiment that's expressed here. Um, and uh, I've already instructed officers to write a letter that will go to whoever the incoming Transport Minister is to say that we are happy to participate in a review of the processes that lead to speed reductions on roads. Um, as the Lord Mayor quoted, and this was from Mr Bailey's letter to the Lord Mayor, TMR supports safe, appropriate and credible speed limits based on the road environment and use. We know that speed limits of 40 kilometres an hour and lower make our streets safer, more accessible and more attractive for all road users. Now, uh, we're on the same page in that regard. Um, what the obstacle has been is the process under the State Government's Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices that that means that council has to go through a speed management process that involves council, the state and the police, and undertaking an independent review of the appropriate speed of, of, for the use of that particular road. Now, if there is will on the state government to make a change, if there is will on the side of the count, this council to make a change, bearing in mind that any changes to the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices have to apply across the whole state, 
they have to be uniform, that's what they call the uniform manual of uniform traffic control devices, um, then we are happy to participate in that process. I'm looking forward to signing off on that letter to an incoming transport minister to say we're happy to support a change in the processes that the council officers have been obliged to follow for years that have led to the frustration of residents when they ask for a speed reduction on a road with the expectation the council can make a unilateral decision on that when the rules under the state uh, guidelines don't allow that to be the case. Uh, it is frustrating when there's a petition that comes in that, uh, that applies the manual of uniform traffic control devices principles that doesn't allow that to proceed. But uh, I think there is spirit of cooperation uh, that's ex been expressed in this chamber this afternoon uh, and by the evidence of the letter that was received on the cusp of uh, the caretaker arrangements for the state government about a change to the process. Council officers are, are happy to participate in that. And with that, uh, Mr Chair, I'm happy to say we support the, the motion before the council today and uh, we look forward to seeing a change in the overall process for the way speed management is undertaken in this city. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I thank everyone who's contributed uh, to the debate before us today. And I just want to put on the record again um, what we are agreeing to as a council, because again, I do not want this um, glorious decision, uh, unanimous decision as it appears it's going to be, uh, to be lost in translation. Um, the uh, motion before us today calls right. for 40 kilometres an hour on uh, Ipswich Road, Annerley through Annerley Junction. Um, it doesn't specify what it's going to be. Um, I know that Council can and has done this in other parts of the city. So the current rules allow this process to unfold. And the there is an example in my own ward of Oxley Road at Corinda, where Council re uh, reduced the speed limit from 60 kilometres an hour to 40 kilometres an hour. That is in place and has in been in place for just under two years. So let me be clear, there is no state government impediment. It was done in Oxley Road, Corinda. It was done in Stones Corner. Um, and in answer to the questions on notice today, this council said it was too hard to provide all the other roads in Brisbane where it's been reduced as well. Um, so let me be clear, there is no impediment. Council's been able to achieve this same result in Oxley Road in Corinda and in Stones Corner. It's all we're calling for here. Now, I've had time to quickly find the um, petition that came back to us in this place two years ago. It was in August 2018. Um, and in that case, uh, the residents, and I'm sure there are councillors who were here then who remember this debate, because this was the petition response that wasn't even sent to me as the local councillor. It was only sent to councillor Ian McKenzie at the time. And if you'd been in the chamber, you'd remember me being pretty cranky about that. Um, because it is outrageous um, that they consulted only the LNP councillor on the eastern side of Ipswich Road and not um, me, the independent councillor, um, on the eastern and western side of Ipswich Road. Um, that was appalling behaviour back in 2018. And who was in charge of the Infrastructure Committee? Bingo. So let me be clear. Um, I support 40. The motion before us today is for 40 kilometres an hour. There is precedent. I will be getting on the phone to Mark Bailey straight after this and telling him he better get his bottom into gear and get 40 going. But I will not accept council playing political games behind the scenes saying change the rules first before we'll put up our 40 proposal. That's not what we're talking about. There'll be a full decision of council today supporting 40 kilometres, not writing some past little letter up there to George Street saying change the rules and then we'll make it 40. That's not what we're doing here. 
We are stating as a council on the record, clearly in public, that we support 40 kilometres per hour. Um, it's so important for our community that more lives aren't lost. Um, we know that limiting speed um, reduces the severity of accidents. And I really do not want to see anybody else killed or anybody else hurt. And I urge council, now we've taken the first baby step to reducing the speed limit. Let's do all the other infrastructure upgrades that are necessary, that the council officers have recommended and that are essential along this busy arterial road. Um, it is a road that divides our community and it should not do so. Annalee is a proud, old and beautiful suburb and it is bisected by this ancient arterial road um, that was built in another era. It has no amenity for residents. Um, it is unsafe. Um, it really um, is a huge disincentive to walking and active travel. And Annerley residents absolutely love being on foot in their local community, but they don't feel that it's safe. So I just want to say, Council can do this. It has proven that it can do it in Oxley uh, Road at Corinda. It's proven it can do it um, on the frontage of non-school areas, like on um, Brisbane State High when they extended the school zone there. Council's, council has done this with the state government before. This is about action, not about more talking and rule changes. And I listened to what Council McLaughlin has said. And if I see the letters going back and forth that talk about process rather than getting the proposal written, putting it into the Joint Speed Limit Review Committee and getting it approved, um, there will be a problem because this council today is agreeing to 40 kilometres per hour. Um, and can I just say uh, to all the Annerley residents, um, particularly Create Annerley, um, Junction Park State School, PNC, the Yoronga Community Centre, um, all the people who have worked behind the scenes over many, many years um, to make Annerley safer, today is a small victory, but it's an important first step to delivering a safer local environment for Annerley residents. And again, I just want to say thank you to Councillor Griffiths, who's been on this journey with me for the last year. Thank you to Councillor Shree for his support. Uh, thank you to the Labor Party uh, and the Greens and the LNP. And I want to see action. And now that we have got agreement, we can push forward for that. Thank you. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Seconded. Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. All councillors are here. I will now ask uh, all those in favour of the resolution, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 26 in favour. The ayes have it. Councillors, further questions? Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. It's recently been announced that the Mowbray Park ferry terminal will be refurbished for residents around Kangaroo Point and East Brisbane. Can you outline the works involved in this project? Councillor Murphy. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Councillor Adaman for the question. And of course, Team Schrinner is absolutely focused on providing safe and efficient travel options to get residents home quicker and safer while enjoying our beautiful city. With more than 5.4 million people travelling by ferry every year, river-based transport is a major part of Brisbane's unique lifestyle experience. That's why we're known as the River City. We want to deliver a world-class network, and that means a network that is reliable, safe, and sustainable. In June this year, the Lord Mayor announced $48.7 million over the next three years to upgrade terminals. This includes upgrades at Mowbray Park, Dockside and South Bank 1 and 2, and a new state-of-the-art terminal at the Howard Smith Wharves. These upgrades will boost flood resilience and ensure that these terminals can cater for kitty cat vessels and increase passenger demand into the future. Importantly, importantly, this investment enables Council to continue to roll out a program of ferry terminal upgrades that meet DDA compliance, our obligations to meet the Disability Discrimination Act of Australia. Council has been gradually transforming its network of terminals, making sure that we have one of the most accessible and inclusive cities in the entire country. 
Now to Mowbray Park Ferry Terminal. Mowbray Park was next on the list for an upgrade and we are now full steam ahead. This terminal is well used and the upgrade will cater for current and future demands while improving its flood resilience. In fact, it will double the terminal's docking capacity at Mowbray Park. Council has now lodged the development application based on a detailed design. The design includes a raft of accessibility improvements, including refurbishment of the existing waiting area to provide an open and more transparent uh, space. The upgraded terminal will provide additional seating and rest zones for people with a mobility impairment, as well as more help points, braille and tactile ground indicators. There will be improved access paths and parking spaces. Council will install an additional fixed walkway connecting from the repurposed waiting area to the new flood resilient gangway and a new dual berthing pontoon. We'll be installing improved lighting and safety features such as increased CCTV coverage. Now, throughout the design phase, the project team has engaged with Council's Natural Environment, Waterways and Sustainability branch regarding the heritage considerations to ensure a holistic view of Mowbray Park is taken into account in design of the terminal. The upgraded terminal goes hand in hand with Council's concept plan for the surrounding Mowbray Park upgrade. The terminal will inco incorporate a fresh look and feel, including new signage. Further landscaping works will improve the amenity and aesthetic of the area, complement the surrounding built form and a modified roof form will enable improved views across the river. The project team consulted with neighbouring residents and as a result of their additional feedback developed modifications to the design. This included ensuring that city cats will be approximately 4.9 metres further downstream away from residences than was originally proposed, which is a great outcome for local residents. In terms of Dockside Ferry Terminal, Council is now fast tracking the Dockside Ferry Terminal upgrade to service both kitty cats and a future proof for city cats. The project will unlock the potential for Kangaroo Point residents to reach much more destinations on the ferry network. While the dockside upgrade is underway, a free shuttle bus between Kangaroo Point and the city will continue to operate at 25 minute intervals. These upgrades will ensure that everyone can enjoy Council's city cat and city ferry services, including passengers with a disability, their families and carers, older residents, passengers using a mobility device and parents with infants in prams. People can expect the designs of these terminals to be a similar design to the New Farm and Guyatt Park ferry terminals, which this administration has successfully delivered. The free city hopper service will resume on the 15th of November with a new timetable that will run at 25 minute intervals and stop at six stops compared to the previous 36 minute monohull service that serviced eight stops. This includes the Holman Street ferry terminal. The new City Hopper will run 44% faster than the previous service because of the highest speed of our kitty cats, which can achieve a top speed of 23 knots versus 11 knots for the old timber ferries. Upgraded infrastructure is also about getting Brisbane back up and running, and that requires prioritisation of projects across the city. In regards to Norman Park Ferry Terminal, there's a history of very low patronage for that Cross River Ferry. Therefore, Council has made the difficult decision to not invest ratepayers' money into upgrading this terminal. So I'm pleased that we're moving closer to construction of these key pieces of transport infrastructure at Mowbray Park and Dockside. Team Trina is making sure that we are hitting the water in a safe and enjoyable experience for all of our passengers by ensuring that we can continue to improve our terminals Councillor across the Murphy, city. Councillor your time has expired. That concludes question time. Councillors, we will now move to the committee reports, please. The Establishment and, Co the Establishment and Coordination Committee report, please, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 2nd of November 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. The report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 2nd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, as I referred to last week, uh, this week is uh, NAIDOC week. And uh, I wanted to... Um, uh, refer to a number of the events that are happening this week. Um, the theme in particular of this week uh, for NAIDOC Week, and there's a different theme each year, uh, is that uh, the history of our country uh, started long before uh, European settlement uh, occurred in our nation. And we know that uh, to be the case, and that is something uh, that is the theme of this week's uh, NAIDOC celebrations and commemorations. 
Uh, we, uh, as a council, are always proud supporters of NAIDOC Week and NAIDOC Week events. Uh, and I wanted to draw councillors' attention to some of the events that are happening. Uh, we've got on Sunday, uh, 8th of November, um, from 2 to 3.30, uh, Aboriginal Art and Cultural Workshop at the Karawatha Discovery Centre. Uh, Monday, 9th of November, uh, 5 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, we had the 98.9 .9 FM Live Outside, Live Outside broadcast at Southbank Parklands, uh, funded by Council. Uh, today, at uh, 10 a.m. to 11, we had the Bush Kindy, Nana Magic, Tilly and Friends at the Karawatha Forest and Discovery Centre. Tomorrow, uh, Wednesday the 11th, from 10 a.m. to 11, and also 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., uh, Grow Your Own Bush Foods Workshop at the Boondle Wetlands Environment Centre. Hopefully, uh, no more bees will be involved in that um, uh, environment centre. It'll be bee-free. Uh, and also at the Karawatha uh, Forest Park and Discovery Centre at 2pm. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we'll have between 10am and 11am the Bush Kindy Nana Magic Tilly and Friends at the Boondle Wetlands Environment Centre. Obviously, people can find out more about uh, the events for NAIDOC Week on the Council website, uh, and there's a link to a whole range of events, including the NAIDOC specific events. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we um, celebrated NAIDOC week with the lighting up of some key strategic assets um, across the city. We've heard today uh, in question time from Councillor Marks that this week is National Recycling Week. Uh, and obviously Council is a big supporter of National Recycling Week and uh, we continue to work very closely with our community to improve the level of recycling uh, and introduce new initiatives uh, to increase that level of recycling. Uh, and I think it's fantastic that we have initiatives like the opportunity for residents to get access to a larger yellow top recycling bin, uh, to have access to the composting hubs around our city, uh, and also the composting bins and the rebate on the composting bins, uh, to support a whole range of projects uh, about um, reducing our food waste as well, uh, love food, hate, wa hate waste. Uh, and a whole range of other initiatives that Council is running out to, um, to the community in support of uh, improving recycling. We are a nation leader when it comes to the scale of our recycling program and we want to see that continue to increase and improve uh, and we will continue uh, to support the efforts of other levels of government to achieve that aim as well. It's great to see uh, people like Trevor Evans in his uh, ministerial role, very passionate about this issue. Uh, and wanting to work with local government across the country uh, to achieve those aims. Uh, and we obviously uh, support further work to improve recycling. I was uh, fortunate uh, to visit the uh, new uh, world's biggest garage sale um, reuse precinct, um, which uh, was just a, a fantastic visit. I last visited them um, a couple of years ago, I think it was. Um, time flies. Uh, that was when they were down at Acacia Ridge uh, in, a, in a temporarily leased facility. Uh, they, they have a new facility um, and the, the way that that organisation has evolved, it's a social enterprise, so it is a business, but the profits go back into the business and it's a profit for, for purpose arrangement. Uh, what they are doing there is just mind-blowing. They are taking uh, not only things and rescuing them from landfill, which is what they started off doing, um, but they are now uh, repairing items and remanufacturing items. So they are taking, for example, broken office equipment and chairs from office works and turning it, either, either fixing it so that it can be resold or turning it into something else. Uh, so they get a truckload, a pallet load from Officeworks uh, every week and uh, it's just a fantastic partnership where they actually do something with the damaged or broken equipment where it may be something that has been returned. So someone may buy an office chair, they decide they don't like it, it's returned, Officeworks can't sell it new. So it then goes to world's biggest garage sale and they uh, repurpose it and reuse it and recycle it. So fantastic work being uh, done there, and uh, we look forward to continuing to support them. We'll, uh, in, in support of National Recycling Week, uh, the Radcliffe Place sculptures are being lit up in yellow today in, uh, in acknowledgement of uh, this important week. Tomorrow, 
of course, uh, is Remembrance Day, uh, the 11th of the 11th. Uh, and we commemorate the anniversary of the end of uh, World War I, but also to reflect on all of those who have died in service of our nation uh, over many years in many conflicts. Uh, and it is a very important um, occasion, just like Anzac Day is, to remember uh, those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and so it's great to see a number of councillors wearing the red poppies. I know you'll all be wearing the red poppies tomorrow and uh, many of you will be participating in Remembrance Day events as well. Uh, we'll be lighting up uh, the Tropical Dome, Redcliffe Place Sculptures, Victoria Bridge and Story Bridges in red tomorrow uh, for Remembrance Day. Uh, this morning I was uh, in uh, Anzac Square and um, they have 75 little white crosses in Anzac Square um, to acknowledge uh, uh, the, um, the special occasion tomorrow. So it's worth a visit if you haven't seen that. Uh, on Friday, the Victoria Bridge, uh, Story Bridge, Redcliffe Place Sculptures and the Tropical Dome will be lit up in pink to support BLAST via Tour de Brisbane. Uh, BLAST by Tour de Brisbane is a new multi-activity free event to keep you moving with friends and family. It includes a four kilometre bridge walk or a community four kilometre ride over the Story Bridge. Uh, all events will start on the Kangaroo Point Cliffs this Sunday the 15th of November. Uh, so please, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, take the opportunity. Uh, it should be a great event for the city. Moving forward, I just did want to pay tribute to uh, a council officer Mr. Keith Foster, who has racked up 50 years of service with council. Uh, it, is, it is an incredible uh, achievement for anyone in any organisation to rack up 50 years, um, but uh, 50 years of loyal service um, as council's principal arborist uh, deserves a special mention, I think, and the support of all of us. Now, I know that many of us, or most of us, would have come across Keith uh, in uh, his work with council, uh, and he's been involved in uh, so many tree-related projects over the years. Um, we, know that, uh, we know that we can um, tell the age and significance of a tree by seeing the rings inside uh, the trunk. I imagine there'd be a few rings inside Keith uh, as well um, after 50 years of service, uh, but... Uh, we did want to pay tribute to him. Uh, during his early years with council, Keith was quick to acquire uh, and perfect his pre professional arborist skills, including tree removal, pruning, transplanting and planting. I'm told that he became well known amongst the crews and aldermen at the time uh, for being a steady pair of hands in dealing with the largest, most complex tree jobs throughout the city. Uh, in the lead up to the 1982 Commonwealth Games, uh, Keith, was responsible for coordinating the planting of over 15,000 street trees a year to make our city clean and green for the games. Um, now, those trees, some of you will be aware of because at certain times of year, they all flower at once and we all get complaints from the asthmatics uh, around the place uh, or people that suffer hay fever, uh, but they are a beautiful asset to the city um, and uh, it just goes to show the difference a single person can make in this organisation uh, in a role like this. Uh, such was his reputation in the mid to late 1980s that he was asked by the federal government and the chief minister of the Cook Islands to share his knowledge with local island workers on the best practice tree management uh, practices. To this day, Keith supports not just the BCC but also other local government areas, state government and research institutions by offering advice and expertise on arbicultural issues. Keith has many more achievements I could list, uh, so many in fact that we would be here for quite some time. But throughout his career, he has never ceased in delivering the best for our residents and his passion and work is a credit to Keith and to this organisation as well. So uh, congratulations to Keith from all of us. Lord Mayor, your time's expired. Move for extension. Second. The extension's been moved by Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Adams. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, item A in front of us uh, is the uh, Moreton Bay Cycleway Viola Place to Schneider Road project. Uh, this is a project that um, we are pleased to see uh, finally moving forward in a positive way. Unfortunately, uh, it has been uh, held up 
um, in a number of, I guess, uh, legal challenges and various other challenges, uh, but we're moving forward to connect this important link. Uh, obviously, uh, we would have liked to see it done sooner, uh, but we're getting on with it. Uh, we have always been committed to it, we remain committed to it, and we're getting on and getting it done. Obviously, the uh, Brisbane Airport and the Trade Coast area uh, will continue to be a growing employment hub, and it is important that there are connected cycle facilities and pedestrian facilities into the precinct, uh, and this will obviously connect an important missing link in the network, uh, and as I said, uh, not before time either. Uh, moving on to item B, uh, the guarantee policy. Um, Corporate Rule FMA 501 describes how guarantees are used to provide council with compensation for credit risk in the event that one party fails to deliver on a performance or contractual obligation uh, to the guaranteed party. Uh, the submission amends council's guarantee policy to al align it with the council approved financial risk management framework, uh, which is the council policy for managing financial risks. Uh, the most significant amendment in relation, uh, is, is in relation to the acceptance of a letter of undertaking in lieu of a bank guarantee or insurance bond from other Queensland government entities. So specifically this relates to the state government. Um, obviously uh, we, we have to assume that the state government is good for the money. Um, some would question that, uh, but we, we really don't have much choice um, in many respects, so uh, this is about um, accepting a letter of undertaking from the state government or state government entities uh, rather than uh, some other form of financial guarantee. Uh, so uh, I'm sure this is something that uh, councillors would support. Uh, if they've worked out a way for us to require a guarantee from the state government, that would be uh, uh, an interesting legal argument, but um, ultimately uh, a letter, of uh, a letter uh, from the state government is uh, what we're uh, proposing in this amendment. Uh, item C, Cross River Rail Council land impacts. This item relates to the State Government's Cross River Rail project, which we support, uh, and new lease arrangements that will be required as part of their works. Uh, as part of the project, State Government will be building a retaining wall along the Victoria Park uh, and exhibition uh, rail line property boundary. Uh, I understand that they will need to inst install soil nails into a couple of small sections in Victoria Park to do so. Uh, obviously it's about pinning down the retaining wall um, and uh, that has impacts into the council controlled land. So um, this is about facilitating that work that needs to be done. Uh, in terms of uh, the ongoing support for the project, we will continue to work with the state government to help them deliver this project in the most timely and efficient way, uh, because as I said before, we do support Cross River Rail. We think it's good for Brisbane, good for South East Queensland, uh, and will provide, together with Brisbane Metro, um, more turn up and go transport opportunities for our city. Uh, so obviously something that we support. Uh, the item D before us is the amendment to the Brisbane City Plan 2014, package K. Uh, in 2019, Council adopted the TLPI 03-19 to provide temporary planning protection to one of Brisbane's most iconic sites, which is Lamb House. The temporary local planning instrument effectively suspends the application of, a city, pl of city plan for a period of up to two years and applies temporary assessment benchmarks while the scheme is amended through a formal amendment process. Uh, what we're doing here is separating out this specific item uh, so that we can move it through the process quickly or quicker um, to get the intended outcome, which is to see a permanent level of protection uh, which is um, uh, up to the same standard as the temporary protection we have on the property at the moment. Obviously, uh, it should go without saying, but I will say that our intention is to see this property protected. Our intention is not to see the property uh, redeveloped our intention is to see the property restored uh, and the existing buildings be restored and uh, to their former glory. And so this particular item helps uh, provide a longer term protection on the house from a planning point of view, uh, which adds to uh, already the protections that are on the house. Uh, we know that it is heritage listed, uh, but this also uh, prevents, uh, if it's supported by state government, 
um, uh, other development occurring on the site. Uh, so uh, I think this is also something that uh, all councillors would be keen to support. And so uh, once Major K Lamb House is through the consultation period and council has reviewed the submissions received, the amendment package will be sent to the Minister for final state interest reviews and for final adoption. Uh, so I do ask count all councillors for their support for this item. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I was to speak on uh, all of these items and at the outset uh, the Lord Mayor um, uh, mentioned it and alluded to um, at the start of his ENC remarks about um, NAIDOC week, and he didn't actually mention the theme, and I will, it's always was, always will be, which recognises that First Nations people have occupied and cared for this continent for over 65,000 years. Uh, Clause A, the Moreton Bay Cycleway, it's good to see, Chair, this project is finally, finally coming to this chamber and to see some movement on this uh, to complete the missing link in the Moreton Bay Cycleway first promised way back in 2014. So for six long years this has been all budget and no bikeway. It's been on the table for far too long. I remember asking the Lord Mayor about this project uh, consistently um, over the years, way back, starting way back in 2016 when he was the Chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee, we were always told that there were legal negotiations going on. Uh, and um, I suppose uh, better late than never um, is better late than never. Um, the delays have come at a huge safety risk to cyclists though, Chair, have been forced to use the busy, busy roads instead of having a safe and direct connection. Uh, many have shared their frustration with the media over the years and online. Uh, some of those quotes, cyclists and Brisbane Airport uh, Bicycle Users Group spokesman, spokesman Mitch Bright said the journey was not for the faint-hearted and posed a daily risk for many people riding to work in the Brisbane Airport area. Space for Cycling said frustratingly there had been a further setback for the dream of being able to connect from the Gateway Bridge to any bikeways on the north side uh, to the employment hub at Brisbane Airport, home to 425 businesses, supporting 24,000 jobs now and expected to double over the next 15 years. Um, it's certainly um, past time to get on with building this connection and reach an agreement with landholders because cyclists are not safe and councillors, uh, council does have a responsibility to change that. My only concern is that uh, when I inspected the file and had a look at um, all of the emails that were contained in there, um, that a notice of intention to resume was issued over a year ago uh, and withdrawn almost immediately after um, Trade Coast Corporation um, uh, raised their concerns. Uh, they have raised the exact same concerns. In fact, their feedback is our previous letter stands in terms of their objections to this. Um, so you certainly hope now um, in this notice of intention to resume, Council won't fold like a deck of cards like they have in the past. Uh, on Clause B, the guarantee policy, uh, recommendation update, update Council's guarantee policy. Uh, the report before us recommends changes which update that policy um, to include relevant parts of the financial risk framework which came through Council back uh, on the 18th of March 2019. Um, I suppose the question I do have um, for the Lord Mayor or for a relevant chair is why it has taken 18 months for this update to come to the chamber. It's not ma that's not made clear in the report why um, this delay um, has been so long. Perhaps it's something they can clarify, but in terms of the actual changes, it's fairly straightforward update uh, for, from our perspective. The main change this policy we've heard is that council can accept a letter of undertaking from other Queensland government entities, including other local governments, government-owned corporations, and government departments in the place of an actual bank guarantee or insurance bond. Clause C, the Cross River Rail project. Uh, we are, of course, very supportive of this. Uh, it's to allow Cross River Rail uh, to access council land at Victoria Park and for the installation of soil nails, as we've heard. Also to allow the widening of uh, the rail under O'Connell Terrace. Uh, it's good to see the state government is getting on with the job here just uh, weeks after a massive election effort. There's no doubt the Cross River Rail project is a critical investment in the future of our city's mobility and public transport infrastructure. It's a good step in the right direction for a project that will boost services, boost speed and access for, South East, for the South East Rail network and hundreds of thousands of commuters. So uh, we're very excited about this project on this side of the chamber chair. Uh, finally, Clause D, the major amendment to City Plan uh, Package K. Uh, the recommendation is to separate the part, uh, as we've heard, relating to lamb, the Lamb House Amendment from the rest of the package to progress it more speedily. It's noted that there are no changes to 
the content of that package, rather splitting them into two. By bringing forward the Lamb House Amendment, it will allow the proposed changes uh, to go out to public consultation sooner. Uh, there is a great deal of community interest in the future um, of this historic building uh, and surrounds, and uh, we have no doubt there will be interest in the amendment from Brisbane residents, so we would certainly encourage people to view those changes and make a submission on that. Uh, this administration chair does have a very poor track record uh, for listening to Brisbane residents, we all know that, uh, before making decisions, unless, of course, uh, the Lord Mayor runs a Facebook poll on his Facebook page. Uh, I hope this LNP administration uh, will take this, uh, the submission, um, or the public submissions on Lamb House into account and listen to residents here. The remaining package will continue according to the process already notified by the CEO. The remaining package contains quite a number of changes, and I'll just outline some of those. Items 266 and 267 and 383. Uh, 3 to 385 removes the character residential zone code protections from pre-47 buildings at 133, 135, 137, 137A and 141 Sylvan Road, Toowong, where there is a series of small tin and timber shops covered by the commercial character building activities overlay under city plan uh, in item, and they all uh, appear to still be there. Uh, item 39 requires structure plans for low density residential development over 7,000 square metres. Trees have been added to the significant landscape VPO under items 62 to 67 and 327 to 381, a welcome outcome from our perspective. Items 17, 19, 23 and 24 allow training facilities and gyms on sites up to 400 square metres permitted as code accessible application in the low impact industry A zoning. Uh, so, again, uh, Chair, these are just some of the changes that have been proposed. Uh, we hope that the administration listens to Brisbane residents and the feedback that they give uh, when uh, these changes come back to this chamber for uh, their adoption and, uh, of course, uh, when, there is, when this administration is assessing development applications in these areas. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item B, the guarantee policy. This submission relates to the corporate rule FMA 501, Council's guarantee policy. Guarantees are normally issued for transaction performance in the context of Council's engagements with third parties. As noted in the policy document, guarantees represent compensation for credit risk in the event that one party fails to deliver or perform on contractual obligations to the guaranteed party, and in this context we mean council. The policy has been reviewed recently and we undertake a review every couple of years. The amendments proposed in this review are largely to align with revisions made at the most recent review of the council's financial risk management framework. As many of you in the chamber would be aware, the risk management framework is the high level framework that supports Council's financial risk management and it has served us well over the years. As the Lord Mayor indicated earlier, the most significant amendments to the guarantee policy is in relation to acceptance of letters of undertaking in lieu of bank guarantees or insurance bonds from other Queensland government entities. This will give Council the option to accept letters of undertaking where this option is considered appropriate in the context of the overall risk associated with the transaction. Guarantees by the Queensland Government entities would have generally been provided by Queensland Treasury Corporation. Ultimately, this policy change allows for letters of undertaking which promote efficiency for Queensland Government entities without increasing Council's counterparty risk. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Point of order. Oh. A point of point order. Of order Chair. Excuse me. Point of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon right. tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Uh, I have a um, motion that this uh, Council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Johnson will be called first after the break. Okay. See you after the uh, 15 minutes.
Excuse me. Councillors, we um, welcome back from afternoon tea. I'd like to advise that in response to councillor feedback, I have arranged for the temperature to be increased ever so slightly for all of, for all of you. I would, like to call on, I would like to call on councillor Johnston to uh, commence her, her presentation. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I say just set it at 24 and we'll all be fine. Uh, I rise to speak on item uh, B and uh, C. Um, just respect, with respect to item B, um, I have some concerns about what's proposed today, not necessarily because of the content of the uh, document, um, the policy itself, but what's not in the policy. Now, I understand that this policy relates to the high-level framework that is referred to in the ENC report and was also referred to by Councillor um, Allen. Um, but the problem is that this council policy stands alone as a document. The policy um, is very clear that from now, uh, state government entities, local governments, statutory bodies only are required to provide a letter of guarantee which will be held by council. Um, what it doesn't address is other organisations and entities. Um, and that is problematic. It is silent on those issues. And we know that when there are problems, um, and there are problems from time to time um, that result in legal action between council and its contractors, um, that these kind of policy documents are what is relied on. So the big problem, I think, with the document before us today is that it is silent on um, the application of a financial guarantee required by other parties, and it only addresses um, those state government and local government entities um, that are referred to in the document. Um, to me, that is an oversight, and it is um, a problem. Into a vacuum, um, this is when uh, you have legal issues uh, that arise. So in my view, this document um, should address uh, guarantees uh, across all forms of um, entities. And we should be clear that even though it's only a letter we're requiring from state, local government and statutory bodies, when it comes to other guarantees, let's say from major commercial builders or um, uh, might be a major property developer, there, there'll be other examples, um, that we may still be requiring a financial guarantee. Now, this document is silent on that, and I think that is problematic. The second thing this document is silent on is um, it doesn't seem to distinguish uh, the, uh, between big and small projects. So I appreciate the state government's going to do what the state government's going to do, and, and we're at their mercy when it comes to a lot of these financial arrangements. Uh, but as it stands now, um, there will be a letter which is accepted by, you know, an officer up at council. It may be a one or a two or a three billion dollar project, um, and somebody somewhere might have a little note on the file saying, yep, we guarantee we're good for the money. That is problematic to me. Um, for these types of uh, letters of guarantee, I think there should be some uh, financial uh, thresholds imposed. Um, because we do need to be very careful to protect uh, council and ratepayers um, from unexpected and unforeseen uh, financial problems. Um, so these two things, in my view, are very problematic with this document. And the first one of those two things that I did mention um, is, is the most problematic from my point of view, because fine, if this addresses the issue that reflects the changes that have been made in the framework, but being silent on the requirements for guarantees for non-state or non-state or statutory bodies is an oversight and it should be addressed in this policy. I would hate to see that there is a problem down the track and because this policy is silent, um, then there is uh, an issue. So certainly I would, um, I would like to see that addressed and equally I uh, don't agree with um, uh, you know, just a letter for, you know, if it's a $5 billion project or a $2 billion project, just having a little note on the file saying, yep, we're good for it. I don't think that sounds fair enough to me. Uh, on item C, very briefly, Cross River Rail. 
I'm interested in this because uh, at the southern end of the portal, uh, like the northern end of the portal, the state government is realising that they have some problems in their ability to deliver the project. Uh, I note that um, there are significant land impacts on the northern end of the Crossover Rail portal. And on the southern end of the Crossover Rail portal, there are major issues as well. I am calling on Council to publicly disclose its position on those uh, proposed changes. Uh, and it needs to be clear whether, like it has at the northern end of the portal, it is going to support those changes at the southern end of the portal. At a minimum, it needs to bring any changes to Council's road network and road safety issues in Annalee to this Council, as it is doing in the northern end uh, of the uh, portal here in Hurston. Um, there is no question that Cross River Rail is an important project. Heavy rail is a brilliant way to move um, people in bulk numbers safely, easily and quickly. But it is really critical that the local community is not disenfranchised by changes to the road environment, parks and access to public and active transport. Um, certainly at the northern end of the portal, Council is obviously cognisant of that because it's brought that item here today. And it is equally important that Council is cognisant of it on the southern end of the Crossover Rail portal at Annerley and Dutton Park. And it brings those matters up here to Council so we as a community are aware of all of the issues and changes that are being made. Um, the CEO has still not responded to my letters on this matter, and I'm calling on Council to do so. <coughs> Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak briefly on item C and briefly on item A as well. Look, um, in the coming years, there'll be a lot of changes here in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. um, Cross River Rail is, is one of those, but also the uh, new award-winning Brisbane Metro. Um, Queen's Wharf, Victoria Park, the Green Bridges, the new Performing Arts Centre and more. So there's a lot of projects that are all occurring at, at the same time and it uh, does require an appropriate management process so Council and all other levels of government can plan and coordinate the cumulative impacts of, uh, on the traffic network, public transport and land. Um, and for that reason we've established a coordination group for major inner city construction projects which is working very closely together um, with at, uh, at the council level and the state level to ensure that uh, all these projects are coordinated and the city can keep running safely and efficiently. Uh, and we're happy to work with other levels of government to ensure that, uh, a successful outcome. And that is what we're seeing with this item C, the Cross River Rail land impacts. Um, it does relate to leases, two new leases that council will be formalising with the Cross River Rail Delivery Authority so that they can um, progress certain aspects of the construction at, on the north side. Um, it does, does relate to a retaining, construction of a retaining wall on the border of Victoria Park and the exhibition line. Um, as the, and the Lord Mayor mentioned that these are uh, uh, soil nails. Uh, I don't think these are items you can pick up at the local hardware store. Uh, the, the lease effectively is a volumetric lease because they need to, to go down relatively deep into the ground to, for the construction of that retaining wall. Um, so Council is entering into a construction trustee lease for five years. Um, there's also a second lease area a little further north of Victoria Park, close to the exhibition station and showgrounds. The state will be widening the rail cutting here, which will impede on some land that Council owns at Lanham Street in Bowen Hills. So Council will enter into a standard lease with the Cross River Rail Delivery Authority for these small slices of land. Um, and uh, as all large scale infrastructure projects require some changes to existing land arrangements, that, uh, those are the matters that will be brought to ENC and then through to Council. Um, in relation to item A, um, I'm very pleased to see a successful um, um, start of the process for uh, concluding this long-standing issue the, uh, um, the, that uh, provides for the missing link of the Moreton Bay Cycleway, Veolia Place to Schneider Road. Um, I think this does prove that, contrary to assertions that have been made by some in the bike lobbyist groups, that uh, this proves beyond doubt that this isn't on council land, that council has been neglectful in not 
proceeding with a project on its land. Uh, this proves the point that a resumption is required to allow this element in the Moreton Bay bikeway to proceed, and I'm very pleased as a local councillor for that to occur. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Mr. Uh, Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Can I just ask item B be taken seriatim for voting item purposes, B? please? Item B? Yes, please. B? Yeah, item B will now be taken seriatim for voting. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just rise to speak on item D, Major K, amendment package, which is now Lamb House and been separated from other parts of the amendment. It was fought, first brought through in November last year to capture changes across a wide range of different initiatives, including the TLPI for Lamb House. The TLPI was adopted in the 20th of June 2019 and an earlier effective date of the 11th June, and it gave us temporary uh, protection to the Lamb House premises for a period up to two years while the city plan was amendment, amended. We're now conscious uh, that the expiry date of June 2021 is approaching, and which is why we have separated the amendments package and expedited the newly formed Major K Lamb House package and get that to publication sooner than early next year, which will now be for the remainder of the package, which will be called amendment, uh, Major K Amendment Other. So the changes in this package will see the character of the house further protected and particular significant vegetation on the site as well. It will prevent any subdivision or further development occurring on the site. Um, we recognise it's a local landmark and one of our city's oldest surviving homes in one of Brisbane's first suburbs and it's held that position for nearly 120 years. Unfortunately, it has fallen into neglect and uh, we need it to get uh, to be maintained and uh, upgraded and what we want to see is protected at the, at the moment with this TLPI and then permanently into the amendment as it comes through. People in Brisbane have been passionate about telling us they want to save Lamb House and we want to thank them for their support and patience through these final last steps. Consultation for the amendment will open Monday the 16th of November and I ask residents of Brisbane to lodge a submission or complete the online survey to have your say on the changes before it closes on Sunday the 13th of December. I look forward to returning to the Chamber with approval to this adoption package uh, early in the new year. Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Thanks very much, Chair. I uh, am rising to speak to item A in ENC. So with this submission, uh, we'll be seeking to make an application to the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy for the resumption of easements for the Moreton Bay Cycleway, Viola Place to Schneider Road project. Um, as some in this chamber will know, the Moreton Bay Cycleway, which is uh, once complete, will connect Redland Bay through to Redcliffe via the Gateway Motorway with a high quality recreational and commuter cycling facility. The critical missing link in this section is the section between Viola Place and Schneider Road. This section of the cycleway is important for both recreational and commuter users who either pass through or are travelling uh, to the Australia Trade Coast, Brisbane Airport and the surrounding areas. The route is identified as a primary cycle route in the city's draft active transport network plan and a principal cycle route in the South East Queensland principal cycle network plan, so very important at multiple levels of government. The current alternate routes are significant diversions which are dominated by heavy vehicle traffic. These routes increase travel time, um, but most importantly they um, significantly reduce safety and thus discourage cycling. This project will involve a 600 metre shared path which connects the existing cycle network at either end. It will run parallel to the Doombin railway line and pass under the Gateway motorway. So to the north, it will connect the Kedron Brook bikeway at Kedron Brook via Lamandra Drive, Lakeside Drive and the bikeway underneath the Brisbane air train alignment before continuing uh, northward towards Redcliffe. To the south, it will follow Schneider Road and Kingston Smith Drive before connecting to the Gateway Bridge and continuing southward to Redland Bay. And to the west, the route follows Lamington Avenue, Nudgee Road, Lancaster Road and will connect into local suburbs and destinations. <clears throat> the project will require the resumption of public thoroughfare easements from three industrial properties. These properties are zoned industry investigation and it's within the Australia Trade Coast neighbourhood plan in the Brisbane City Plan 2014. The total easement area required to facilitate this project is 2,607 square metres. This connection will provide improved safety for all users, suitability for cyclists and pedestrians of all ages and abilities, reduced travel times and improved local access. 
It's an important catalyst to increasing active and public transport use, and it's part of this administration's commitment to getting residents home quicker and safer by creating dedicated bikeways and walkway options. Now, sometimes uh, projects appear straightforward, but they are uh, much uh, more complex from a legal and engineering perspective, and I would say that uh, Viola Place certainly fits that bill. Uh, there is a mixture of land ownership in this area. Council has expended a great deal of uh, time and effort over a number of years in negotiating with key landholders. Council issued a notice of intention to resume to start these works in February. However, an objection was received via the landowner. Council has followed the due process and addressed these objections. The objections have been heard by an independent resumption delegate and Council has now responded to the delegate's report. Council is now in a position where in order to move forward, uh, we must refer the application to the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy for approval. And as someone who has ridden the Moreton Bay Cycleway from Redlands uh, to Redcliffe, I, I get just how critical uh, this missing link is and I know uh, just how much our cycling community here in Brisbane has waited for us to get on with this project. So uh, we are now getting on the job with the job and that is exactly uh, what we are going to do over the next few months and proceeding through uh, this process and hopefully uh, we will have construction starting as quickly as possible next year. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Uh, the Lord Mayor's uh, not in his chair at the moment, so we'll move straight to a vote. All right. All councillors, all, though, all those in favour of items A, C and D, say aye. 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 Those against, say no. The ayes have it. Councillors on item B, all those in favour, say aye. Aye. Those against, say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by Councillor Johnston. And Councillor Shree, please ring the bells. Councillors on item B, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hands. Aye. All abstentions, please raise your hand. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 22 in favour, one against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. I will now refer you to um, the City Planning Report, please. City Planning and Economic Development. Count, uh, the Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And last week we had the Manager of Economic Development and the Office of Analytics give us the latest update on our economic figures in Brisbane. And it's no surprise, of course, the only uh, update out of all of that that Councillor Cook and Councillor Cassidy seem to re keep repeating is that it is going to take until 2022 till we get back to pre-COVID standards of where we were in our economy. That doesn't mean we aren't on our way back. We are seeing more feet hitting the pavement in the city while dining and entertainment industries are gaining 
gaining momentum. We're on the mend. There is a flow of an effects of businesses picking up in those industries as well. And what is really great to see is the strength in pedestrian numbers in the Queen Street Mall. They've bounced back from a low that was about 20% of our usual um, PED numbers in April to nearly 80% of our pre-COVID levels in October. And that means, again, people are going to be back in the city and supporting those local businesses. We have had a gradual increase of people coming back into the workplace. It's growing from a 40% reduction pre-COVID um, in April to less than 20% in October, providing a much needed boost for hard hit CBD businesses, as I said. We continue to support with the Economic Recovery Task Force. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Coupled with that strong local buy campaign that the Lord Mayor spoke about earlier this evening, and we are working hard to make sure we reposition our business community to survive and thrive. We recognise there is still a long way to go, but it's great to see our resilient city that have seen droughts and flooding rains over the last couple of decades slowly but surely bouncing back from the coronavirus. And I know just in the next few months, the improvements we are going to see as we near the festive season and the events we have coming up. There was also a petition for last week that I will leave to the chambers. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Yes. Councillor Johnston. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, just briefly on item B, um, and I'd ask that it's taken seriatim for item voting Item B, purposes. taken seriatim for voting. Yep. Yep. Um, firstly, I want to put on the record um, my concern. I... Uh, moved a motion in this place a few weeks ago, um, which Councillor Adams blocked and will continue to block um, until she decides uh, it comes back on the agenda about problems with rooming accommodation. And I remember that debate. Um, Councillor Adams stood up and said um, that uh, I didn't know what I was talking about. She wasn't aware of any problems. And now, as it turns out, uh, she actually um, tabled a, uh, a petition um, uh, where clearly um, almost 600 people have talked about a very similar problem, and that is um, the lack of specificity in city plan when it comes to uh, material change of use and rooming accommodation. Um, it is very, very clear that there are some developers in this city who are exploiting the inadequacies of city plan 2014 um, to put huge amounts of rooming accommodation into areas where it is just not suitable. Um, now, this is a very specific subset of that problem, and that is where um, uh, student, uh, the, the student accommodation coming into areas which is a form of rooming accommodation. And this makes it very clear. And the interesting part of it is, I mean, Council Adams, if you, I wish I'd have pulled the debate out so I could read back what she actually said. Council acknowledges the specific problem um, in this very paper before us today. So it's no wonder she doesn't want that motion on the table for debate, um, because it's pretty clear to me that Council does know that there is a problem. Um, uh, and it also appears to me that Council is a little bit delusional about what to do with that problem. So let me um, just refer to a couple of these items in the paper before us today. Student accommodation is generally developed under the land use rooming accommodation as defined under city plan. Um, depending on the design of a development, it may or may not require council approval. Um, and then it goes on to talk about parking, open space, relaxation, uh, open space, rela space relaxations, um, provisions for car parking, and how they're different depending on whether or not it's privately certified or approved by council. It is a quagmire into which developers are exploiting the provisions around rooming accommodation in this city. I have problems in Fairfield, in Yoronga, in Yoronpili and Tennyson, and I know there are other councillors with similar problems. Now, um, it goes on to say... Um, that with regard to the request that Council not approve the change of use applications from student accommodation to a different type of use, Council is unable to prevent applicants from lodging particular types of development applications. Fine. That's not what people are saying. They're saying to Council, we don't want you to approve these types of applications. That is within Council's remit. Not only that, 
um, there should be mechanisms in place to change city plan to prevent this type of development. Now, that's the motion that I moved about a month ago, that Councillor Adams and the LNP councillors are blocking. So here are another 600 people telling you that there is a problem with city plan. It is having adverse impacts. Now, I'm not saying we've got to ban all rooming accommodation. It's just where it is impacting adversely in low density areas. There is a real problem here today. 600 people petitioned council and Councillor Adams stood up just a few weeks ago, no, nah, there's no problem here. And just because Councillor Johnston says there's a problem doesn't mean there's a problem. There's a big petition which you tabled and you knew about and is now coming through this place, through you, Mr Chairman, to Councillor Adams. There is a real problem here. It needs two things to happen. One, it needs amendments to city plan to tighten the regulations around rooming accommodation. And two, it needs council to refuse applications that are outside of the planning scheme intentions and outside community expectations. The response before us today does neither of those things, and I do not support it. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I just can't uh, go past without making the comment the enthusiasm of the only councillor in this chamber who can't be bothered to be on the City Planning Committee and resigned her position. Pity she could not join us on Tuesdays, but that's for another day. Uh, the petition we have here before us was born out of the Atira building saga on Glen Road in Tawong, which was an absolute uh, deplorable decision by the state government to turn student accommodation building into public housing. Very, very different to rooming accommodation. This was turned into public housing. And it was done overnight without any consultation and without any plan to manage the consequences. Subsequently, we got a request from student accommodation on Coronation Drive to say they would like to change their building into rooming accommodation, which they got a very, very, very firm, fast, fail, no. And they withdrew their application. We do not support in this place student accommodation changing to rooming accommodation. There are very different requirements for the management of those buildings and the amenity of residents. This was a disappointing outcome in Glen Road. Um, car park rates, space requirements, all of it relaxes student accommodation for a very specific purpose, not good for the temporary people living there in public housing. And with regards to the saying no and blocking the petition that Councillor Johnson again Loving the verbaling from Councillor Johnson, making up her own ideas and her own version of how it happened in history and trying to rewrite the books. That motion was laid on the table until the housing strategy came through for discussion, which will happen early next year. Thank you, Mr. I'll now put the resolution for item A. All those, uh, all those uh, who support uh, item A, please say aye. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Those against, say no. The ayes have it. On item B, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll move on. Uh, the Public and Active Transport Committee, please. <coughs> Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated, uh, held on Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Thanks very much, Chair. Just before we get to uh, last week's committee report, which was on active school travel, I just wanted to uh, report some great news uh, to the Chamber. Last Wednesday, our new operator, River City Ferries, took operation of the Brisbane City Ferry Network and what did anyone notice? Absolutely nothing. Business as usual, which is exactly how a seamless transition uh, or business should be. Uh, no glitches, no issues, no problems, a smooth, 
clean transition from one operator to another and a momentous day in the history of our ferry network. So um, I'm also uh, very pleased, very proud to announce that River City Ferries have transferred across 100% of the Masters and Coxswains from Transdev, uh, apart from one person who decided to take the opportunity uh, of a 10-year contract handover to retire. Uh, so congratulations to that person on, on their retirement and um, uh, welcome or welcome back to the 100% of other uh, frontline operational staff who continue uh, from Transdev now with River City Ferries. So I think uh, I would all agree, we would all agree here that that is a fantastic outcome uh, for the travelling public to have the uh, cumulative hundreds of years of experience of those uh, ferry operators uh, back on the river operating uh, the existing city cat fleet and uh, soon to operate our new kitty cat vessels, uh, which will start service from five uh, 34 a.m. this Sunday. So uh, these new ferries will service North Quay, South Bank 3, the Maritime Museum, Riverside, Holman Street and uh, Sydney Street terminals with increased capacity and speed. The new Kitty Cat City Hopper will run at 25 minute intervals with an 11 minute improvement over the previous 36 monohull service as we heard earlier today. So um, really exciting time for the travelling public on our ferry network and I'm sure uh, they cannot wait till Sunday and if you go and if, if for anyone who's in Brisbane Square who's been looking out the window, you can see the red branded uh, city hoppers doing their practice runs uh, at the terminals now as we speak, getting ready in preparation uh, for that very uh, momentous occasion. So Chair, uh, last week's committee presentation was on the active school travel program. And we know that creating a culture of active travel from a young age is one of the great tasks of Council's travel behaviour officers and a concern of uh, all of us here in the chamber. And this year marks the 14th year of the active school travel program. Exceptional work has been done in this program which encourages school children and their parents to make healthy travel choices such as walking, cycling, scootering, carpooling and taking public transport. This is a three-year supported travel behaviour change program open to all primary schools across Brisbane. Participating schools receive a range of tailored support from council, including support from a dedicated council officer, customised active travel maps, uh, assembly performances, bicycle and scooter skills training, bus orientation and road safety lessons. Um, the program has been an initiative since 2004 and 166 schools and 121,000 students have graduated to date, a momentous achievement. In 2019, the program changed the travel habits at 13 primary schools, resulting uh, in, uh, two in, in one in two families in those schools leaving the car at home, which is a really big impact. Now, despite COVID-19, the 2020 intake increased to 18 new schools coming on board. Active school travel has proven to reduce single car journeys and increase the number of families travelling by foot, bicycle, scooter and public transport or car sharing. The program aims to have at least a 10% shift away from car use to other modes of transport, but I will say some schools have recorded uh, up to a 70% shift in active travel on their active school travel days, which is a remarkable impact. And you know that if we were able to replicate that across every school in Brisbane, that it would be like school holiday traffic all the time, which I think we can all agree would be a gold standard to achieve for our city. I don't know that any city has achieved that yet, but I'm sure if there is a city that achieves that, Brisbane will be the first, and it will be thanks to active school travel. As you know, schools pick a weekly active travel day, such as walking, wheeling Wednesday, trekking Tuesday or footloose Friday. In May 2020, schools began to progressively reopen and it's been great to see them re-engage with AST and implement their active travel days. 35 schools have now restarted their weekly active travel day. First year schools are now using their new printed active travel maps and participating schools have hosted or are uh, planning to host COVID safe active school travel events. The program is being adapted to new ways of working and learning, which includes uh, developing a new suite of promotional and road safety videos in lieu of assembly performances, implementing COVID safe practices for the delivery of bike and scooter skill sessions, such as bring your own bike, and offering additional bike, scooter and bus buzz sessions in lieu of assemblies. 
Chair, active school travel complements Council's Safer Paths to School program, which builds on these outcomes. These important programs are all about ensuring that there are fewer cars on the road and more active, engaged and healthy kids. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Listen, um, I rise to speak in regards to this uh, Clause A, the, um, the Act of School Travel. Um, I, I suppose it's, uh, it's fair to say that uh, over the last 14 years, um, the program has, uh, has achieved quite a lot um, for a number of schools uh, right across Brisbane. Um, I'm sure there's many councillors here that have uh, taken part in an early morning walk uh, um, when, those, uh, when, they, when the parents sort of park uh, away from the school, uh, in the surrounding streets away from the school, and um, so that the congestion uh, at the school is minimised. Um, I have a number of schools in my ward. Uh, I'd like to have a lot more, and uh, one of the reasons why I'm speaking on this is uh, to relay to the chamber um, what, um, what some of the feedback I've had from um, one or two of the schools that have uh, taken part. Uh, sadly, one of them that uh, was, take, uh, was taking part uh, last year uh, um, did not uh, undertake it this year, and, uh, and, and the reasons for that was that the school was really, I mean, the kids were happy enough to do it. The school was really behind it uh, with uh, a lot of incentives um, for the kids to take part um, by way of food and other things. And, um, but it was, the, it was really trying to motivate the parents to actually uh, uh, take part uh, in, the, um, in the program. So um, a couple of the uh, teachers or the organisers uh, for the program uh, within the school um, uh, spoke to me and said, listen, um, if it comes up, uh, could you uh, ask the council or the uh, program organisers to uh, maybe have a look at doing a, uh, a review of the program itself to try to massage or to try to increase uh, the numbers of uh, schools taking part and, of course, the number of parents and children taking part in the program. And I said I would be happy to do that. They didn't s suggest any one thing that would possibly help uh, increase the, um, this, uh, uh, this program. Um, they suggested that the, um, some, one of the schools say, listen, we, we, we've tried the incentives and that was fine for a while, but um, uh, in, in the end, the kids either wanted to do it or the parents wanted to do it or they didn't. Uh, others were suggesting that maybe the incentives could be changed um, because it has been going for 14 years and I don't know if there has been a review over that period of time, a, a uh, root and branch review um, of the program, uh, but uh, um, if uh, Councillor Murphy can take that on board uh, through you, Chair, um, I think it's, uh, it's, wor it's a great program, I think, uh, and it's uh, worked very well in my ward. Um, um, even before I was uh, obviously a councillor um, and uh, had great support, but uh, over the years it's sort of uh, waned a bit, uh, at least in my word, I don't know about others, but I assume that probably um, that's probably happened as well in other wards. So uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Um, I've undertaken uh, and uh, brought it up here today in regards to maybe looking at a review on behalf of a couple of my schools, so thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Murphy. Just very quickly, Chair, uh, I would say uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Strunk, for contributing to the debate on this item. And of course, uh, I would take uh, those comments and that very uh, uh, admittedly non-specific feedback about the program on board. But I will say uh, that we have evolved active school travel numerous times uh, throughout its history. Uh, from, from when it was introduced uh, to today, it has evolved uh, a number of times. We've always been able to improve uh, school take-up of the scheme and the experience for uh, the kids who actually take part in it, and as well as the parents at home. And um, uh, certainly the, the way in which we've evolved the scheme during COVID will not be the last iteration uh, of active school travel. I take on board what you said uh, about the, the gifts or the incentives that were given out. That's some feedback that... Um, uh, we actually heard at the committee 
recently because, um, as you know, we don't live in a bubble. Uh, school kids are increasingly becoming environmentally aware. Um, you know, you could say that they're the most environmentally aware of any generation, and they don't really. Um, some of them don't enjoy the little plastic and rubber handouts that come with the active school travel program. So we're looking at, uh, you know, potentially introducing tree planting uh, to the schools as a reward for uh, active school travel. So uh, there's kind of there's all those kind of initiatives that we can use to take a one council approach to uh, how we incentivise active travel in the school and um, uh, we will take those uh, comments that you've made on board in the good faith that they were made. I'll now put, uh, put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. <coughs> Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. The presentation of two items before us, uh, item A and item B. So at item A, the committee presentation last week was on the completion of the Kingston Smith Drive project, uh, which we're very pleased to have uh, presented to the committee uh, and for the interest of the committee to see the, uh, the complexity of the work that's been under, undertaken there. Um, the, uh, the presentation was, uh, I think, proof of what we've been saying about this project for a long time, that it's a lot more than just a road project. Um, some of the challenges were evidenced by this diagram, uh, which is, uh, shows, and I might table this if I may, Mr Please. Chair, uh, at the completion of my, uh, of my speech, um, but shows the, uh, the complexity of uh, the services in the ground, the utilities in the ground at just one location, which was replicated all the way along the corridor uh, with new drainage, old drainage, old Telstra lines, uh, old gas lines, new gas lines, new um, gas and electricity, new Energex conduits, uh, a real spaghetti of different services that were provided just at that intersection. And that was one of the issues that, had, was, that the engineers had to grapple with through the project. And that's certainly one of the other things that was shown in the presentation were, were the depth to which uh, the engineers had to work to provide for these services. Now, they're absolutely crucial for future-proofing this area. Uh, you may recall we embarked on this exercise in 2015. One of the drivers was the state government's uh, uh, commitment to, uh, new, to uh, the uh, priority development area at Hamilton North Shore with the commitment to have 15,000 people living there without any provision of public transport infrastructure. So that was one of the main drivers. The other major driver was to provide for a, a proper bicycle and pedestrian connection between um, uh, Hamilton and Albion. And that was a major, one of the major objectives of this proposal, as well as providing for the road network, the increase of, the, of, of capacity on the road network to allow for future growth of the region to the airport, to, to Hamilton North Shore itself, where there was no public transport provision, uh, and, and to the gateway bridges. All that this was an important element in the long-term future proofing of our city, um, one of the major gateways, uh, a road network that was already seeing up to 70,000 vehicles moving per day in both directions. There was never a peak hour in the evening, in the, in the morning and the evening on Kingston Smith Drive, because it's a 12 hour a day peak. So this was what uh, was presented to, we pr was presented to the committee last week, was the uh, complexity of that project, a, a testament to the, to the workers who worked on this when construction started in 2016. Um, and uh, 5,000 workers undertaking over 4 million work hours to get the job done. Uh, and the proof is in the use of this new infrastructure, Mr Chair. We see, uh, have seen since uh, the Loris Bonny Riverwalk element was completed, over 800,000 people using that infrastructure. Uh, cyclists and pedestrians moving with active transport to and from the city uh, and, and enjoying what I believe is the, a view of the best reach of the river. Now, if uh, the Labor Party had had its way, they would have killed that project. That was their commitment, to kill this project dead, 
to, to stop the contract. That was, uh, they, they had more positions on KSD than Kama Sutra. Uh, first, they, first, they, first they supported it, they said get on and do it, then they said no, don't do it, uh, back away, stop doing it. Uh, and while they just sort of prevaricated from side to side, going around the houses on, on the KSD, uh, we got on and, and got on with the project because we knew it was a, a critical element in the future proofing of our city. So I'm, I'm very proud to stand here as the infrastructure chair, uh, as the local councillor who, who um, uh, sought the uh, bikeway and uh, pedestrian infrastructure in particular to be make sure that was part of this project. Uh, and I'm very pleased to see that it was uh, delivered. Uh, now, yes, behind schedule, that's true. Uh, but that was an announced behind schedule, but I'm very pleased to say it was uh, under the established budget, which was $650 million. So established, uh, created uh, under budget, and a, and a great outcome it is to Mr Chair, uh, and uh, I'm sure that we'll reap the benefits of this in infrastructure for decades and decades and decades to come. It's what people expect of uh, at administration to make sure that we look to the future and provide for future infrastructure needs. That's what they expect of good local government. Um, Mr Chair, the other item before us was uh, uh, a petition requesting Council immediately widen uh, a road in uh, Banyo, Nudgee Road, or to knock the speed limit there to 10 kilometres an hour. I'll leave that to the Chamber for any debate. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mr Chairman. And I'd like to speak about both the issues. One, uh, Kings, and, Kings and Smith Drive, and also then um, this petition. So the first thing about Kings and Smith Drive, and it just rolled off um, the chairperson's tongue, just rolled off $650 million. It only cost $650 million. $100 million. $100 million of ratepayers' money per kilometre of road. $100 million. That is an incredible amount of money for this gold-plated project. This gold-plated project. I don't know if the chair has read the Courier Mail today or seen the list of footpaths that we can't fix across this city because they cost a couple of million dollars. We can't build bikeways, we can't build intersections. And in this uh, petition that's coming through, we can't fix a stretch of road so cyclists can travel along that stretch of road at Nudgee. $650 million, it's nothing. It's a hell of a lot of money. And it's a lot of money that's been spent on one project and it has delivered very little for the residents of Brisbane. So next time, it's talked about, remind yourselves, we're talking about this LNP administration spending $100 million on one kilometre of road. That is just incredible. And the, the audacity to say it was only $600 million and it was only a year overdue, wow. I, I just find that out, uh, astounding. Which brings me to my second point. And it was interesting, this resident was so, he's trying to get action from this council, from this administration. He took out an ad in the local paper. He's got, he wants public support. He's trying to get his councillor to do something. His councillor is one of the most marginal in the city. And he's in his electorate, one of the most marginal councillors in the city. And a, a response comes back that, Interesting, if you read this response, hidden in this response, it actually says, yes, Nudgee Road needs upgrading, that it is unsafe, and what has Council done? It's even done preliminary design work for this upgrade. It was done uh, last year, last financial year. So yes, it needs upgrading, it should be done. We've done the road design. What's the big problem here? No money. No money. But we've spent $100 million on Kingswood, Kingswood Smith Drive per kilometre. There's a common theme here. 
There's a common theme here. We're big with the, we're good with the big ticket, big spend items that we say we're, we're do, delivering well, which we know we aren't. This administration don't deliver big projects well. There's a blowout in time frame. There's a blowout in dollars. There's a blowout in everything. And we can't deliver the basics to the suburbs. I feel sorry for this gentleman because he just believes people should be able to walk along that stretch of road safely. He just believes that people should be able to cycle along this stretch of road safely. We support this resident. And we support these residents right across the city because what they're saying is we want council to provide the basics. And we want council to provide the basics in the suburbs. And as of yet, I still haven't heard his the representative of this gentleman get up and speak about what he's done to ensure that this, this will be delivered for him. So this uh, petition doesn't have our support because it says we're not doing anything. It says tough luck, mate. We recognise there's a problem there, but tough luck because we're not going to do anything for you. Uh, I move. Set, I would ask that this uh, this um, petition is taken seriatim. Item B taken seriatim. Just for voting, obviously. Voting. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's always fantastic to hear the confected outrage from the shadow chair for infrastructure, who never bothers to ask any questions in committee, uh, but gets up here when the cameras are on him to, uh, to have, a, have a crack, uh, mainly to trying to secure his pre-selection, I think, for future, uh, for future showings, to show that he's uh, having a go at the Tories. We, 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 we know, we, we know, we know, we know what he's on about. We know what he's on about. We are up to, We know what his game is. Uh, just, just no, don't, no more interjections, please. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, you know, <laughs> you, you should ask. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right, everybody. Okay, councillors. All right. This has all been a bit of fun. Back on topic, please. <laughs> look, uh, when when there was a half decent leader of the Labor Party in this place, Milton Dick, and. Uh, um, and Shane Sutton, uh, a couple of good and capable Labor uh, opposition leaders in this place, they demanded that we fix Kingston Smith Drive. They demand, they, sat, they stood here time after time, budget after budget, get on and fix Kingston Smith Drive. They railed against us. And when we did, there was a, th there's a been a backflip. There's been a backflip, as I said, more positions than the Karma Sutra. And, and, and the fellow traveller there for the Labor Party, Councillor Johnson, interjecting as well. I hear her in support of her Labor colleagues. They're always interjecting to support support her Labor colleagues uh, without saying anything no, meaningful, Johnson, of course. Councillor Johnston, please cease interjecting. Councillor McLaughlin. <laughs> Thank you for that intervention, uh, Mr <laughs> Chair. Uh, well, all, all I hear is chatter without knowing what the words are, so I can just hear the banter, but I know it's in support of the Labor Party. Look, uh, I read the Courier-Mail, um, and one of the, the articles in the Courier-Mail I'm very pleased to quote from again in regards to Kingston Smith Drive was from Michael Madig Madigan, a note to our tradies who just get it done, who just get it done. And that's what the Labor Party... Uh, fails to see, and they, ask, they should ask themselves the question, why did they only secure five seats in this place? It's because they railed against, in their latest iteration of their position on Kingston Smith Drive, against it. They had Patrick Condren peering into the hole every second day saying, oh, what's going to happen here? Woe is us. Uh, and what happened? They, they didn't secure any extra seats based on, on their campaign because they're ignoring the workers of this city. They're ignoring the workers of this city. That's what they, they failed to see in their strategy. They, they, they hate the workers. You're right, Councillor Ryan. Councillor Murphy, they hate the workers of this city uh, and we support them and make sure that we've got work for them to do. That's what we're doing, building a better Brisbane every day in this place and making sure there are jobs for the people of this city. I now put the resolution for item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And now to item B. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division called by uh, Councillor Cassidy and uh, okay. Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bell.
Councillors, all those in favour of item B, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. And uh, those abstaining, please raise their hand. But you, Councillor Johnson, do you vote? Uh, yeah, yeah, please read the result when you're ready. That's all right, just while we're sitting, we do have to ask. It's all right. Clarks, Mr. Please Chair, the, the ayes have it. The uh, voting being 16 in favour, five against, and one abstention. Uh, the ayes have it. Councillors, I'll now move to the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, our committee presentation last week was the Brisbane Carbon Challenge. Uh, this is an exciting new initiative of Council, which includes an online carbon calculator and an awareness campaign that supports Brisbane residents to understand their household carbon footprint and to take action to reduce their emissions and save on bills. By taking the Brisbane Carbon Challenge, you will learn about the carbon emissions created as a result of your household's transport, home energy use and waste, and receive tips on how to reduce your emissions and save on household bills, potentially by thousands of dollars a year. A key part of the challenge is the recruitment of 20 champion households across the city. These demonstration households will work with a coach who will audit their home energy use, transport and waste habits, and develop a tailored action plan to help them reduce their emissions by 50%. The purpose of this is to gather data on how households can best reduce their emissions so that these experiences can be shared with the wider community. I encourage councillors to complete the carbon calculator, share it with your constituents and encourage them to consider applying to be a champion household. The Brisbane Carbon Challenge is an example of real and practical action by this administration to deliver a low carbon and climate resilient city, while also supporting local residents and businesses to recover from the economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. Mr Chair, we also had a park naming submission in committee last week for Solferino Place Park at Michaela Crescent The Gap be named Soldiers Settlement Place. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the Carbon Challenge um, initiative. I did, did the survey online. Um, I, my annual household carbon footprint is 0 0.38 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, which is quite a bit lower than the average, and that's it's because, it's because I um, live on a houseboat with solar panels and I don't drive um, very much. But, um, and I think it's a good thing that the administration's doing this, and I, I sort of support the general principle of it, but I think it also highlights one of the sort of common criticisms of council, and particularly the LNP, um, I should probably add, often of Labor as well, which is just that we put a lot of energy and emphasis on individual responsibility for addressing climate change. I do think um, individuals have a responsibility to do what they can, and I, I try to practice what I preach in that respect. But I think we let um, big business and we let big institutions off the hook when we spend time and energy saying, you as an individual should do a better job of driving less, but then we don't provide adequate public transport or safe cycling infrastructure. Or we say that you as an individual um, are doing a bad job because you're um, consuming too much energy, but then we don't have good systems in place to support renters to have solar panels, for example. So, I, I react a little bit against the philosophy that sits underneath this, which is to simply shift responsibility for climate action purely onto individual residents, rather than saying there are structural and systemic issues that, that as a local government and as, as governments in general, we would be much better placed to address. So I think that's not a criticism specifically of this initiative in isolation, but when you put it alongside what else council is and isn't doing. I think it, it does paint a broader picture where um, council simply isn't doing enough, particularly around transport. I, I acknowledge there have been some positive steps in a few other areas of council to 
um, for example, purchase green energy, et cetera, et cetera. But we are continuing to design a, a city transport network that pretty much forces a lot of people to drive. Um, there are entire chunks of um, suburban Brisbane that are very poorly served by public um, transport that don't have good active transport community co connectivity. Um, we've designed a city that makes it really, really hard to, to live a sustainable, low carbon lifestyle. Um, and then we spend um, time and resources telling residents of, oh, you need to cut down your, or you, like, here's what you're doing, here's how you could do a better job. Um, but not really putting the money and resources into doing our bit of the um, bit of the puzzle. So I, I think I don't, yeah, I don't don't want to be too critical of what I think is still comes from a good place. But um, yeah, what, where's the commitment to um, improving public and active transport? We see a little bit of that. Um, it's starting to come from um, some parts of council, but. It, it's still nowhere near where it needs to be. And I think if this council administration was serious about supporting residents to reduce their carbon footprint, we'd be doing a much better job, particularly in terms of transport, um, but also in terms of sustainable development and design and, and housing justice, et cetera. So I'll leave it at that. I'll be interested to hear how other councillors did on the, on the carbon footprint and what results you all got with your households. Further speakers? Councillor Davis? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councillor Marks. Thank you, Chair. I was just filling out my carbon calculator. My, I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee held on Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 3rd of November 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Marks. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. We only have one um, committee presentation last week at our um, committee with about the Botanic Gardens Living Collection. Um, it was actually a very interesting um, presentation in such that Dale um, Arvidsson, who is our curator of uh, City Botanic Gardens, uh, Mount Cutha, sorry, didn't actually get through the whole presentation. There were so many questions asked of him in, um, during that presentation that was supposed to be on the sort of 10 most popular or strangest plants, I suppose you'd call them, um, that we have at the Botanic Gardens up at Mount Cutha and also mentioned Sherwood Arboretum. Um, and um, like I say, there were so many questions asked, we actually didn't get through all the presentation, but um, it was certainly um, in interesting and I know he had trouble getting it down to just 10, so um, potentially we'll get him back again to give us another 10 if anyone's interested in attending that committee. Thank you. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Marks? I now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Howard, the uh, Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated the Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, last week we had a presentation from the Acting Manager of Creative Communities, Lifestyle and Community Services on the Cube Effect. The Cube Effect is a program that was established five years ago under this administration, and it was wonderful to hear about the impact that this program has had to help our young and emerging Brisbane musicians make their mark on the professional music scene, with 144 emerging Brisbane artists taking part in the program so far. The Cube Effect is not just a competition. It's an amazing youth music program that not only showcases and promotes our young and emerging musicians by providing live performance opportunities, but also provides promotional and priceless development opportunities. This year, we received 85 applications that were assessed by a panel of industry experts who had the difficult task of narrowing them down to a selection of 24 finalists who then had the opportunity to each create a music video that was professionally filmed and edited. We had more than 16,000 visits to the Council's website to check out the videos, and it was wonderful to see more than 5,000 people vote in the People's Choice Awards this year, which is even more than last year. 
The program included 102 paid performance opportunities, as well as a playlist of this year's finalists available on Spotify. It was lovely also to be joined by Councillor Atwood at the Cube Effect 2020 Awards Night last month at Brisbane Powerhouse, and I'd like to take this opportunity to once again congratulate all of the talented artists that took part in this year's Cube Effect, and in particular to congratulate this year's award winners. The People's Choice Award, Katanak, the Innovation Award, Lucy Jane, Best Live Performance, Fresco Kyoto, Best Original Song, Sakem, and Lord Mayor's City Hall Concert Award, Danica and Forte. I'd like to thank our hardworking officers for the wonderful work they do to deliver this invaluable program for our young and emerging Brisbane artists, and I commend the report to the Chamber. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Excuse me. It's been moved by the Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Landers, the report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 3rd of November 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Before um, moving to the committee report, I did want to uh, respond to a couple of points or questions that were raised earlier in the meeting. Um, to the point that uh, Councillor Cassidy made about the duration between the update of the financial risk management framework and the update of the guarantee policy, uh, in March uh, 2019, a number of amendments were made to the financial risk management framework, including the acceptance of guarantees by state government entities when Council approved the financial risk management framework. Like the financial risk management framework, the guarantee policy is updated every two years and is scheduled in this particular um, window. So uh, in the context of why it's uh, been about 18 months since the financial risk management framework was updated and the, uh, the update to this, it's just a, a matter of the cycle of the updates of these particular policies. Uh, it's also worth uh, noting that no letters of undertaking have been submitted for approval and none have had to be considered by council in the last 18 months. Now, uh, with respect to uh, some of the points that Councillor Johnston made, um, the guarantee policy can't be read in isolation. It's certainly worth reading in conjunction with the financial risk management framework. And in that document, it outlines that bank guarantees and performance guarantees are sought when we're um, looking to uh, secure contractual arrangements with uh, non-Queensland government entities. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that while we will accept uh, letters of undertaking from Queensland Government and other related entities, um, it's not a, an obligation and obviously in the context of perhaps larger or more complex contractual arrangements, we could seek to take another form of security. Um, moving on to the uh, committee presentation. Um, we had a, an excellent update that provided some insights into the great work that's been undertaken by the uh, disaster management team. Um, in particular, they gave us uh, a bit of an overview on how they've engaged in the, uh, the COVID response activities, with most of their activity being in the context of supporting hotel quarantine operations. Uh, they also highlighted the difference of um, the way that um, BAU disaster management activities work, where it's very localised, and the COVID activities that they were involved in, which were driven at a national level. Um, there were a number of uh, program highlights that were uh, illustrated, and in particular, the one that jumped out at me was that um, we've got 5,000 new subscribers to Council's early warning alerts. Um, system and that takes uh, total su subscribers to about 160,000 and that's obviously relevant as we uh, uh, come into a storm season. Um, the uh, La Nina 
effect apparently is uh, evident across the Pacific and the likelihood is that we're going to have heavier rainfall between now and the end of February. Um, they also touched upon some of their prevention and mitigation measures, um, particularly around land management and uh, managing bushfire hazard reduction, um, drought management and also some of the governance issues that they had in uh, working with, um, with other counterparties. In the context of preparedness, it was very much focused around uh, helping residents get prepared for storm season and in those locations where uh, bushfire is a risk that was also addressed. So certainly they've been undertaking a lot of work. Um, the disaster management team is well trained and uh, certainly, certainly ready to address any uh, disasters that might befall us. Um, they also uh, touched upon some disaster uh, exercises that they'd undertaken in particular around uh, setting up evacuation centres. And I thought particularly pleasing was the uh, uh, Brisbane City uh, State Emergency Service Unit where um, they've been active uh, in a number of different operations. And as I suggested earlier, the COVID operations at Brisbane Airport, um, bushfire um, management on Morton Island. Um, but importantly, they uh, have about 650 members and uh, have managed to attract uh, 230 new members in recent times. So I think uh, that's a great outcome. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further debate? Anyone? Councillor Allen? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. And for clarity, I'm not sure if my microphone was on or not, but the ayes also had it on the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee as well. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Hutton. Yep, I've got a petition that Council officially named the bridge over Bullockhead Creek on Boundary Road, Richlands, as Frank Holland MBE Bridge with permanent signage. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I've got a petition on behalf of the Lord Mayor. Councillor Murphy. Uh, Chair, I've got a petition requesting Council to implement traffic calming and signage in Tollett, Tinchbourne and Tybury Streets and Torbay Road, Chandler, to minimise traffic and reduce speeding vehicles. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a petition on behalf of Councillor Cunningham requesting Council look at measures to disincentivise non-local motorists from using Woodhill Avenue, Cooparoo as a shortcut between Cavendish Road and Leicester Street. Councillor Adwood. Thank you, Chair. I have a petition that Council reduces the speed on Ragnar Road to 40 kilometres and Majestic Crescent to 20 kilometres in Hemant. Councillor Owen. Thank you. I have a petition of 1,046 signatures that was gained in one and a half weeks requesting that Council name the sports fields at Heathwood Park, 140 Parkwood Drive, Heathwood, as the Matthew Conwell Sports Fields. And in addition, I have got letters of support from Ashley Conwell, who is Matt's wife and now widow, uh, Queensland Cricket, James Cullen, the Metro South West Cricket Association, the Brisbane Super Kings Cricket Club, McGregor South Cricket Club, Kenmore Cricket Club and South Juniors Cricket Club. Councillor Strunk? No, no, no. You're... Are there any other petitions? May I please have a uh, resolution to accept them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? No. Councillors, are there any ordinary matters of general business? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak um, on the LGAQ conference, which I had the great honour um, to represent Brisbane City Council with Councillor Cook um, and Councillor Matic a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was with great pleasure uh, to see the excitement on the people down the Gold Coast that it was the first convention back um, down the Gold Coast at the centre. Um, and there was people from represented from all over Queensland. Um, I sat with the digital era um, debate and um, that we listened to on the Sunday, uh, which was quite interesting because that was one of the regional councils, and it was it was really sweet. One of our smaller councils turned bar cold, and it was 
turned around and asked a question of who, which council does this the best out of every city council? Um, it's a bit unfair uh, for the regional councils because of course it was Brisbane City. Um, and I did say that to the Barkey councillors with uh, kind of, sorry guys, but you know, we are the largest council, so you didn't have a chance. Um, so one of the debates uh, which we listened to was about the Balcara changes and what the effects of that is to our regional councils. Um, it affects all of us, the changes, but more importantly to the regional councils. Some of these councils, some of the Indigenous councillors that I was speaking to um, on Tuesday um, were really concerned, asking valid questions because one particular councillor, she's a new councillor that I was speaking to, she's related to most of the people in town. So most of her constituents are her relatives. So that means that she can't truly and openly represent her constituency um, if she obeys by these Balkara laws. So there certainly has to be some changes to these laws so these councils, especially in our regions, can operate effectively. Um, another thing I'd like, is, I think is worth noting, is the amount of new councillors that 2020 um, has embraced. Nearly every second councillor that I had the privilege to speak to was actually a new councillor. Um, and their excitement and their honour of being there to serve their community. Again, I would like to thank the Lord Mayor, the Deputy Mayor um, and this team for putting their trust in me to represent Brisbane City Council down at the LGAQ conference. It was certainly worthwhile and I thoroughly enjoyed all the different debates. Thank you. Further general business, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm uh, rising. Thanks. Uh, rising tonight to speak about NAIDOC Week. Uh, the theme for this year's NAIDOC Week is, always was, always will be. This recognises that First Nations people have occupied and cared for this continent for over 65,000 years. The official NAIDOC website details the importance of this theme this year. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first explorers, first navigators, first engineers, first farmers, first botanists, first scientists, first diplomats, first astronomers and first artists. Australia has the world's oldest oral stories. The first peoples engraved the first maps, uh, made the earliest paintings of ceremony and invented unique technologies. Always was, always will be acknowledges that hundreds of nations and cultures covered this continent. All were managing the land, the biggest estate on earth, to sustainably provide for their future. NAIDOC Week 2020 acknowledges that hundreds of nations and cultures uh, covered the continent uh, and it celebrates that our nation's story didn't begin with the documented European contact, whether in 1770 or 1606, with the arrival of the Dutch on the western coast of the Cape York Peninsula. The very first footprints on this continent were those belonging to First Nations peoples. This truth is important in the context of the current body of work with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This council unanimously supported the Uluru Statement from the Heart last year, but passing a motion is not the sum total of support, far from it. The central tenets of that national movement for change are voice, treaty, truth. The Uluru Statement calls for a First Nations voice to Parliament to give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a meaningful say in the decisions that affect them. The three key elements to the reforms are constitutional change, legislative change and a Makarrata Commission. These elements involve a voice in the Australian Constitution, a Makarrata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making with Australian governments, which in turn oversees a process of truth telling about Australia's history and colonisation. I have tried to lend my voice to this conversation as much as I can, but I am just one person. We need the weight of council and all councillors to be on board with this national movement. We cannot walk away and wash our hands of responsibility because we supported a motion in this place. Council's own website doesn't even have a mention of our support for the Uluru Statement from the heart. When you search the word Uluru on the website, the response you get is no results found. 
This is absolutely extraordinary to me. Brisbane City Council in the year 2020 still has no reconciliation action plan. The most recent document we have that attempts to deal with these issues was developed in 2005 and evaluated in 2008. How can we support the self-determination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people without in the very least having a comprehensive strategy and then, maybe then, contributing to that conversation? Australia has a dark and racist past. The past isn't something we can change, but how we move forward is something we can control. Australia denies its true history more than just about any place on earth. We need to change that, and as the biggest, in, uh, biggest council in Australia, we should be leading. The Uluru Statement from the Heart has been translated into 60 languages to ensure it has the broadest reach here and, and around the world. It's sad to think that it doesn't even appear here within council in one single language. So I plead with the Lord Mayor and every councillor here, use your voice and lead. For the general business, Councillor Adaman. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak about one of the great hidden treasures in this city, which just happens to be at the Brisbane Botanic Gardens, Mount Cutha, in the Pugan Vale Ward. As councillors may have already gathered in speeches I've given to this chamber since being elected, I'm very fortunate to have one of the city's crown jewels located in the area I represent. Under the leadership of curator Dale Arvidson, the challenge to maintain the, uh, the Botanic Gardens as one of the city's major tourist attractions has not just been achieved, but exceeded, positioning them right up there with South Bank as one of the key tourist attractions in this city. No easy feat for this administration, given the other projects on the go. His dedication and passion for the gardens is second to none and highly infectious. It's hard not to be interested in the stories behind the thousands of species of plants on show. On a recent inspection of the gardens, Dale pointed out a new feature which demonstrates to me the Schrinner administration's respect to the history of this city by reinventing an attraction that was central to Brisbane hosting the Brisbane Commonwealth Games in 1982, to it potentially featuring as a selling point for our bid to host the 2032 Olympic Games. I'm referring to a work created by a, a prominent Brisbane sculptor, Rill Hinwood, called George Street Fountain, which was unveiled by Queen Elizabeth in 1982 while in Brisbane for the Commonwealth Games. As the CBD has undergone a major transformation over the years, George Street Fountain could have easily just become another memory. But it has been brought back to life at the Botanic Gardens under the new name of Subtropical Treasures, and I predict it will become one of the city's most popular wedding gardens. Set as a backdrop to lush green lawns, the carvings on each of the pieces to, uh, depict native fauna, once common throughout Brisbane, tree, uh, Brisbane, tree ferns, palms, orchids, wild ginger, wild berries and fungi. Finally, Mr Chair, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Kath Thornton, who last week became the new president of the Brookfield Show Society. The Brookfield Show is one of the most popular community events in my ward and was sadly missed when it, like many other events this year, was cancelled because of the pandemic. This had a serious impact on the society's bottom line, so it was even more important that the new president had the runs on the board and the experience to deliver next year's show. Kath Thornton ticks all of those boxes. Since moving to Brookfield in 1989, she has been actively involved as a volunteer, member and later executive member of the Brookfield Horse and Pony Club, the Brookfield Show Society and the Brookfield District Museum. There isn't a role at the show Kath hasn't undertaken, and I'm confident that she and her very capable executive team will deliver a show for the ages next year. Our best wishes and thanks uh, for a job well done also go to outgoing Show Society President Jenny Peratz, who leaves Brookfield next month to be closer to her family in Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further general business? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak briefly about an issue which I, I don't think should be a political issue, but which I, I, hope, um, I hope maybe some councillors will be given pause to reflect on a little bit. Um, it's, it's a fairly minor one in, in the grand scheme of things, but it, it goes to growing concerns about the availability of public green space. Um, and it's a shame that neither the Mayor nor the um, 
Chair of News is in the chamber at the moment, but hopefully my comments will be relayed to them as well by whoever the, um, who is responsible for that portfolio at the moment. Um, but maybe it's also of relevance to um, the Deputy Mayor and her capacity as Chair of City Planning. We've got a phenomenon in a lot of inner city parks where there's quite a bit of old parking um, that's remained within the boundaries of the, those public parks. Um, Historically, I can understand why, why that evolved, but now as these inner city suburbs transition to be active transport friendly precincts, a lot of residents are starting to ask why is it that so much inner city public parkland is just used for car storage? Um, if anyone's in front of a laptop and wants to have a look at this, uh, I, I encourage you to put in the address 60 Hill End Terrace, West End, into your Google Maps, um, and you'll see an example there of parking in a public park that has some of the best river views in um, Brisbane. It's like prime riverfront real estate, sweeping views of the river, but instead of people being able to have a picnic there or kids being able to play on the grass, it's just bitumen used for car storage. Um, I do think it's important to have parking provision for um, parks, particularly destination parks that people might travel to from other parts of the city. I think from an accessibility perspective, it is certainly valuable that um, people can travel in and find somewhere convenient to park. But we don't have the balance right in Brisbane at the moment. Um, and I'm particularly thinking of parks like Davies Park, Riverside Drive, Orley Park um, in my ward. There are, but there are also similar issues in other parks and other wards around the inner city where too much green space has essentially been turned into parking. Um, and I think where, where we do need parking in for, to service a park, it should be at the perimeter of the park, so around the edge of the park, rather than motorists driving in right through the middle of the public green space, which reduces safety for pedestrians in, and, and park users in general. Um, and I've, I've raised this issue directly with a couple of council officers, but I actually wanted to prompt the councillors in the chamber to think about this, because we spend a lot of time <laughs> arguing rightly for the need for more public green space, but um, a lot of what is technically parkland is actually currently used as bitumen, and it would make more sense if we had an open conversation about shifting some of that parking either to the edge of the park, so that cars aren't driving through the middle of the park, or in some cases getting rid of it altogether. And I think in particular, council city planning team probably has a role to play in this space because it goes to what, what, we are, what kind of urban landscape we're trying to create and the, um, the experience of people moving through the inner city because quite often there, there are situations where pedestrians will be wandering through a park and then suddenly they're coming into conflict with cars. Um, they can't just let, let their kids ride a bike through the middle of the park or, or roam freely because they're worried their kid will get hit by a, a car and you would think that a public park is the last place that parents should have to worry about that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm not dogmatic about it. I'm not saying um, we have to scrap all car parking in all public parks, and I hope no councillor tr tries to disingenuously misquote me on that topic in the future. Um, but I just don't think we've quite got the balance right at the moment, and I hope particularly the Lord Mayor and the Chair of News and, and other relevant chairs will, will pay a bit more attention to this issue, because I'm noticing it popping up again and again now. Partly it's a safety concern where particularly parents report that they don't feel safe letting their kids enjoy these parks because of the presence of cars driving around looking for a spot to park. But partly it's also just an amenity issue where um, so much of what should be public green space and what is zoned as public green space is instead being used as bitumen car storage. And um, it just doesn't really make sense when that land could be used much more efficiently and effectively. It's high value land, particularly in these inner city areas. Um, we're talking about millions of dollars of real estate, which is given over to private vehicle storage um, when residents are telling me that they would much rather be able to use that space for picnics or for um, sport and recreation, um, or even for trees and, and vegetated natural green spaces. So I'm throwing the idea out there to encourage all councillors to think a bit more broadly about this and to ask your residents what they think. I'm, I'm sure you'll get different answers further out in the suburbs where green space isn't quite as in, in such short supply, but certainly in the inner city in those inner ring suburbs, um, there's a lot of green space that could be freed up simply by reducing the footprint of car parking within public parks 
and where, where appropriate, removing some, moving some of that park into the perimeter of the park rather than right in the centre. So hopefully that will be conveyed to the Mayor and, and the relevant chairs. Thank you, Councillor Shreeth. Councillor Landers. Deputy Chair, I rise to speak about Grace Beecher, a former resident of Brackenridge Ward. I was very excited to finally be able to welcome Grace and her family and friends to see the new seat outside the Brackenridge Library that has been named in Grace's honour. Although the seat was installed earlier in the year, we were unable to show Grace until recently due to COVID and her inability to leave her home. So once residents of her retirement village were able to go out again, she was able to visit the library and see her name on the plaque. In 1986, Grace Pearl Beecher joined the Sangate and District Historical Society and Museum Incorporated to research her family history. Her passion for research soon expanded to encompass our local area's history, and Grace was appointed researcher for the museum. Grace would travel by public transport to the archives John Oxley Library and the State Library at least once a week. Grace has been instrumental in naming many parks and recreational areas in my ward and has now provided copies of her talks, photographs and research to the State Library and Sangate Museum. <coughs> Even now at the age of 89, Grace is still researching and produces a historical newsletter for the residents in her retirement village. Her latest publication is a story about Augustus Hodgkinson Davies. Or Gus. Gus, an Indigenous man born in Port Douglas in 1885, later moved to the Sangate area. He served in both world wars and was granted a parcel of land under the soldier settlement scheme in the area now known as Chinchy Tamba wetlands. Gus married, had a family and later hired out boats at Deepwater Bend near Wayampa Road. And of course one of our much loved local parks in Bald Hills is named Gus Davies Park after Gus. It was a pleasure to meet Grace, who is now a life member of the Historical Society, and to also have her fellow society members, Pam, Yvonne and Barbara, there to see Grace's work recognised by the Brisbane City Council. Thank you. Further business? Uh, Councillor Strong. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, I rise to speak on a, uh, a couple, uh, three items here tonight. Um, and uh, it all revolves around this special month of, uh, of November. Um, and the, the first one, of course, is uh, tomorrow where we, um, where we celebrate uh, Remembrance Day um, on the 11th of the 11th. And uh, a special day in my heart because it's, it's, it's the day that I'm able to acknowledge the, um, the military service of my uh, father and other family members, uh, and uh, and I think that's uh, it's important that we do that. Now the RSL subbranch at Forest Lake, um, they uh, un have undertaken the service for Remembrance Day for a number of years. It has grown in size and scope over the years. Um, this year, of course, it's going to be a little bit restricted because COVID-19, but there is plenty of space uh, within in the amphitheatre at the memorial there, I think, for uh, certainly a few hundred people. And, um, and uh, the schools are now embracing the, uh, the service as well uh, and, and uh, each year. Um, but I, I remember when it first started, uh, we were lucky, uh, well, the first uh, couple of years that I attended, um, we were lucky probably to have 20 or 30 people, and, uh, but now it's, uh, it's, as I say, it's grown in, uh, in scope and size. Um, this year, we, um, working with the uh, RSL sub-branch, um, we uh, commissioned a, um, a, uh, poem, co uh, a, a poem contest. Um, and what we asked the uh, school uh, kids to do is to have a think about what Remembrance Day means to them and to, uh, and to write a poem. Now, I thought that was probably going to be a little bit tough because um, I thought maybe an essay would be a little bit easier, uh, but uh, my, uh, my team uh, and the RSL said, no, no, let's, let's definitely do the poem and uh, we'll, uh, we'll allow the, the winner to actually um, have that poem read out uh, during the service. Um, and uh, I'm, pr I'm, I'm glad to say now at the present moment we have over 50 poems that were submitted which I think was uh, quite fantastic. And, uh, and I really look forward to hearing that poem uh, read out tomorrow. 
Um, the other, uh, one of the other events, of the course, that happens and that uh, was spoken about uh, um, by, uh, by the mayor and the opposition leader, um, Councillor Cassidy, is NADOC week. Um, again, I'm very fortunate to have a large contingent cohort of uh, Indigenous uh, and Torres Strait Islanders in my ward. Uh, and uh, we have a fantastic uh, elders group um, that, uh, that look after uh, the interest of the uh, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island community. Um, and we as councillors, uh, and I say as councillors, Milton Dick before me, Les Bryant before him and others, have always supported um, this, uh, this group. Um, but they're not the only group in the area that actually do fantastic work. Um, in, or, in, in support of that community and, and supporting NADOC Week. Uh, again, uh, because of COVID-19, it's been a bit restrictive uh, this year on the types of events that they can hold. Um, and some of those events over the years have been quite large in size and scope. Um, but um, I just want to acknowledge um, a few uh, members of that community. Um, in the, in the ward, and the first one I'd like to acknowledge, of course, is Uncle Albert Holt, who is a very prominent uh, uh, indigenous leader in my area, is known right across Brisbane and uh, in Queensland. Um, he's an author of two books. Um, he was uh, a pioneer. He pioneered the police uh, service uh, liaison um, officers uh, program. Um, he was one of the first to put his hand up and, uh, and work with the police service for many, many years. He also um, helped initiate the, uh, uh, was one of the driving forces behind the Murray Courts as well. Uh, so he, he leaves a, he leaves a fantastic uh, legacy uh, in the community, um, but uh, you know, he sort of retired a few years ago, but he, he's out every day still doing things. You know, he's just an amazing, amazing man. Uh, I do want to also um, acknowledge the, um, um, Len Waters, who was the Australia's first in Indigenous uh, fighter pilot during World War II, um, who um, settled uh, in the in the Inala area um, after the war, and um, and uh, I recently sat down with uh, one of his uh, daughters and um, had a long conversation, and she's looking to do some work in the area, and I look forward to that. Uh, I want to congratulate the, of course, the Indigenous community as a whole. Um, even with the COVID-19, they are out there making a difference. Um, they have an art show going online. They've sold over 50 paintings already. Um, so um, that's uh, COVID-19 is not stopping what they do, even though they have to go online. Uh, lastly, I want to speak about um, another event and um, time of year that's uh, called Diwali. And, uh, and uh, I know we all probably uh, have been to one of those Diwali um, uh, events uh, here at uh, either at Brisbane Square or in King George Square. Um, sadly, because of COVID-19, once again, I keep repeating myself, I know. Um, but uh, as we know, it's, it's a festival of light. Um, it's a celebration uh, that revolves around the triumph of uh, good over evil, purity over impurity and light over darkness. Um, uh, again, I'm very blessed to have a very large uh, Indian community within my ward. Um, they're one of the first to come and say, what can we do to help, whether it's a litter cleanup or any other event that actually happens in my ward. Um, they're one of the first to put their hand up, uh, in some cases put their hand in their pocket and help out as well. Um, the, um, as I say, the ward is, uh, is uh, blessed to have uh, those people. And of course, um, we've, uh, they, they undertake a lot of uh, programs over the years. Um, uh, the one that I've supported uh, right from the, the start is the GOPO, uh, the Global uh, Organization of uh, Peoples of Indian Origin. Um, and they do a lot of fundraising for Diwali and um, I've always supported them. So again, thanks uh, to those who um, continue that work, even uh, with the restrictions that we have. And uh, at that, I'll uh, finish. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise tonight to speak on events of significance and also a park naming. 
Uh, Mr Deputy Chair, can I firstly turn to the Planning Institute of Australia awards that were held on Friday night and extend a gra uh, congratulations to Howard Smith Wharves that received um, an award on Friday night. It was wonderful to see that these Queensland awards were actually spread right throughout the length and breadth of our state and it was wonderful to see that many people were turning out to actually show support of their pr profession. Similarly, the Restaurant and Catering Awards were on last night and uh, at both of those events, um, representing the Lord Mayor, I got a lot of feedback from people and Councillor Adams um, and Councillor Allen, in respect of the Economic Recovery Task Force, a lot of people in industry are appreciative of the efforts that Council is going to, to make sure that we are doing what we can to support businesses. But can I particularly acknowledge some of the um, Brisbane-based businesses that received awards last night? And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Jimmy Shu, who received the Lifetime Achiever Award of 55 years service in the re restaurant and catering um, uh, sector. And Jimmy is born of Chinese parents, but was actually born in Sri Lanka and has now um, got a restaurant in Darwin. So it's a real multicultural affair that uh, Jimmy has with his love of food, but also um, serving people across many cultures. But particularly for the Brisbane-based businesses and um, restaurant in the restaurant and catering arena, I'd like to acknowledge Communa Cantina, Everton Park. Wynum and Dynam Catering in Woolongabba, uh, the Apprentice Chef of the Year, Ryan Phipps, the Chef of the Year, Ton Manvel, uh, Found You in Milton. Uh, I know this spreads across quite a few councillors' areas, so I think it's important that we do acknowledge it. The Balfour Kitchen in New Farm, Jumbo Thai Restaurant and Bar yeah. as well. Um, Paw Paw Cafe in East Brisbane, Gambaro Seafood Restaurant in Petrie Terrace, and this was p a particularly poignant last night because um, I did notice that um, some of the Gambaro family were holding up pictures of Michael Gambaro, and there was a lovely tribute to Michael and his contribution to the Restaurant and Catering Association across Queensland, but in particular, I think it's important we acknowledge his contribution tonight to the City of Brisbane. Um, Little Glass Room Espresso Bar in Mount Gravatt was another one. Room with the Roses, just across the road here in the CBD. We had a number of regional ones that uh, certainly won a lot of awards. Uh, Montrachet in Bowen Hills. Customs House uh, received the commendation for Convention Centre Caterer. Um, Corbett and Claude uh, won the pizza restaurant category. Massimo Restaurant and Bar also won one. And then up at uh, Gambaro's again, the Pisoni Italian Restaurant was another award winner. And we also had Blackbird Private Dining and Events Brisbane. And in the major award categories, the caterer of the year was Customs House. The casual dining of the year was Little Glass Room at Mount Gravatt. And the restaurant of the year for South East Queensland was Montrachet. So there were quite a lot of significant awards that came across. So congratulations to all of the people who won awards at both of those events, but most particularly, Thank you for the efforts that you are going to to continue your business. And today is a very um, difficult day in some respects because it sits between two major events of significance. Yesterday was what is referred to as Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. And for many people, this was the turning point in World War II. And I think being in the Jewish synagogue here in the city of Brisbane on Sunday night with Councillor Howard and also Councillor Cumming attended, I think it was a very, very respectful service that was undertaken. And having a lot of people there from the younger generation shows that there is a very important way that we can all contribute to making sure that the events of the past that have caused horrific circumstances are something that we should learn from and endeavour to make sure are never repeated again. 
We should all strive for peace. We should all strive to respect each other. Many people in this city come from multicultural backgrounds. There are many different religions that are practised here. And in the city of Brisbane, we endeavour to foster respect to ensure that we have a foundation of harmony across our city. And through that respect of each other, of those beliefs, I think it is important to make sure that we can do that and, in essence, that will help us work towards a peaceful world by working together. On Saturday night, I represented the Lord Mayor at Legacy Ball and Remembrance Day is obviously tomorrow, as has been reflected on. I had the privilege when I went to all of the World War I battlefields and visited the Menin Gate to read the ode and be the sole wreath layer at the Menin Gate. And that will stay with me forever. During my time um, in France and Belgium, when I went with my son, he had the opportunity to lay the medals of two great uncles on their graves in Perone Cemetery and Bethelem West Farm Cemetery, and also lay a wreath for his great uncle, who is listed on the Menin Gate as part of the 641st. This is something that I think is a personal aspect, but we can never know the horrors of war because we have not walked in the boots of those soldiers. I would like to use this Remembrance Day to remember one of our local veterans who has recently passed away, and I'm sure Councillor Strunk will also have known John Sheehan, um, because John was the poster boy for assistance dogs with his lovely little dog, Tubbs and he is well known through um, our local community. And John served in the Navy, but he also served for many, many years as the State Secretary of New South Wales, RSL. Mm -hmm. I'd like to now move to the park naming for which I uh, submitted a petition for earlier tonight with a number of letters of support. And out of all of those letters of support, I'd like to read an extract of a letter that has been submitted by Ashley Conwell, who was married to Matthew Conwell, who the sporting fields are requested to be named after. And I will just read an excerpt out of this, given the short time that I have left. It reads, as the wid widow of Matthew Conwell, I am truly humbled by this gesture and wanted to write to you to formally endorse this petition. I also wanted to share some additional information which I trust will provide Council with confidence in why these sporting fields should carry Matthew's name and why Matthew is a worthy recipient of this honour. The widespread support is a testament to the man that Matthew was and the impact that he had on everyone that he met. Regardless of how long you knew Matthew, be that years, weeks or simply hours, he always left a positively lasting impression. It is humbling to see that people genuinely want to see Matthew honoured in this way. While Matthew's coaching abilities are evident, I believe that he, it was his most recent roles with Queensland cricket and his involvement in junior cricket where his kind-hearted nature really shone through. Matthew was once that junior player and I believe that is why he was so passionate about creating an inclusive and fun environment for girls and boys of all ages. This is the man that will be remembered and celebrated. It is important to note that Matthew frequented the Heathwood sporting fields and was heavily involved in the development of the junior cricket club who used those grounds. Given Matthew's career achievements, his contribution to the local community, and the fact that he was a talented and humble cricket and soccer player himself, I believe it is very fitting these sporting fields proposed to be named in his honour include a cricket pitch nestled between two soccer fields. Matthew was a loving, genuine, humble, loyal man who believed that the most beautiful things in life are not things, they are people, places and memories. They are feelings, moments, laughter and love. It is these values and belief that Matthew 
name gives to these sporting fields and to the community who will enjoy these grounds for Councillor generations Owen, to come. Councillor your time has expired. Councillor Cummings. Thank you, Mr Chair. I would just wish to speak briefly on a new festival that's uh, going to be uh, on this weekend in Wynnum on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And it's, uh, and it's been uh, organised at fairly uh, short notice by a young gentleman called Tom Oliver, who is a, uh, in his 20s and he's a uh, very talented musician. But he's also very good at uh, producing events as well. So it's produced uh, by Tom Oliver Productions. Uh, the uh, sponsors include the Queensland Government, the Arts Council is giving a significant amount of money, I heard $80,000, uh, Rain and Horn, uh, the Brisbane City Council, my SEF fund gave $5,000, I don't know if, I, if Councillor Howard's managed to raise, raise up some money as well, Iona College, our local developer BMD, who are always good community supporters and they are uh, the sponsors, and the Fringe Festival has uh, singing, dancing, acting, magic, you name it, we have it. And it's all uh, on the street or in uh, buildings in and around Wyndham Central. The buildings are small, intimate uh, venues, and on the street it's, it's open air. So it's, uh, it's a, great, uh, a great way of uh, putting on a show, and uh, Tom's done extremely well. I'm looking forward to it this weekend. The venues include Green Park, which is down on the... Uh, down on the Esplanade, uh, as is Pandanus Beach, uh, Edith Street, one of the main streets in Wynnum, which will be closed most of the weekend. The Wynnum Opera House. Now, did, you didn't know we had an opera house in Wynnum, did you? No. Well, we've, uh, well, I think it's one of the old churches. Anyhow, I'll, I'll have to make sure I get to the right place. The Wynnum, Wynnum Church Hall. Uh, Win sorry, no, Winston Church Hall. I think that's somehow like Winston Churchill, but anyhow. Uh, and that is the, the hall that goes with the old church. Uh, Callaher's Dance Academy, it's a local... Uh, dance uh, business and uh, they've got uh, a beautiful sprung floor where the performances will be on. Uh, Mrs Quinn's car park. Now Mrs Quinn is one of our landladies around the place. She's probably the biggest landlady in Wynnum and uh, she's uh, made her car park available. And the Salvo's loading dock and I think that'll be an excellent venue too. That's where they, where they load the stuff in for the local Salvo store. So it's making use of the local facilities. A lot of the uh, the, the streets in Wyndham Central, there's little alleyways between, uh, between uh, one street and the next and uh, they're using all these open spaces in the alleyways and that as well. There'll be, uh, there'll be food trucks, there'll be a bar, there'll be uh, uh, various other forms of entertainment. A lot of the performances are free, but the most expensive ticket I've been able to find so far is $25, so it's $25 and, and cheaper. And, uh, and these are, some of the acts are very professional acts uh, that uh, Tom uh, knows as part of his uh, uh, performances himself. And uh, I can say one of them's already booked, booked out already. It's, uh, it's Shrek, Shreklesk. Shreklesk, this is probably how I suppose, or Shrekless Q or whatever. But it's, uh, it's all based on Shrek, but apparently it's a bit crude and a bit, uh, uh, but it's also a bit, a bit crude, a bit funny uh, and a bit musical, but it's all got all the songs from Shrek as well. So, uh, but it's already booked out for, uh, for Friday and Saturday night, which is a shame. Uh, but uh, I'm sure a lot of the other shows will be booked out as well, but uh, it's a great thing to be put on in, uh, in Wynnum and congratulations to Tom. He only started organising this a couple of months ago. He's a, one of the professional performers that has had uh, a, a grievous loss of uh, income with the, uh, the COVID crisis. He hasn't been able to perform much at all and he decided he needed something to uh, keep himself busy so he's put this together at very short notice and done a great job and I'm sure it'll be a great festival for the Winter Manly area. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further items of general business? No, I see no one standing. Uh, before we close the meeting, can I remind councillors to please sign the attendance book? And with that, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, councillors.